Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure. We will uh, go ahead and get started. Hopefully everyone is familiar at this point with the rules of uh, engagement and, and participation. If anybody watching has any issues uh, figuring out how to participate in today's hearing, please feel free to email the committee secretary or the committee manager. Uh, the email address is on uh, the agenda, which is posted on Nellis. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, handle our first order of business today. We will open up the hearing on Senate Bill. Oh, look at that. Can we get a, a roll call vote, please? Secretary, thank you so much. Senator Brooks? Here. Senator Hammond? Here. Senator Pickard? Senator Spearman? Chair Harris? Here. Uh, note we have three members present and we do have quorum. Please mark Senator Spearman and Pickard present as they arrive. Okay, take two. We will now open up the hearing on Senate Bill 448, and I'll, I'll welcome our colleague, uh, Vice Chair Brooks, to the table. And I believe he has several other presenters with him. So, uh, Senator Brooks, uh, please proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Harris. I have uh, with me today is uh, Bob Johnston, who will be um, at the table with me if that's uh, okay with our rules. Um, well, we've got folks a lot closer than the last time uh, we had our, our hearing in the room, and so I anticipate it, it should be fine for Mr. Johnson to join you. Right on. Thank you. And he'll also be uh, the PowerPoint driver. And um, also t today with me is um, uh, we have Director Bob Sien from the Governor's Office of Energy, uh, Director Brown from Governor's Office of Economic Development, and Mr. Bob Potts from the Governor, uh, Governor's Office of Economic Development as well and they will be um, here to uh, present part of this and to answer questions um, when we are done. My name is Chris Brooks, Senator Chris Brooks from Senate District 3 in the uh, middle of Las Vegas, and I'm here to present Senate Bill 448. Uh, Senate Bill 448 is an attempt for Nevada to capture its place in the new energy economy. Senate Bill 448 uh, has several provisions that help Nevada take full advantage of the resources we have and the potential we have to attract billions of dollars of, of private capital into our state to be able to take full advantage of federal infrastructure monies coming to our state and to create tens of thousands of high paying local jobs, all while reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and helping us to meet our climate goals. I am going to, if, it, if it's okay with the chair, um, walk through some PowerPoint slides and don't um, be uh, alarmed by the, the amount of PowerPoint slides because I will go through them quickly. They are at, for a reference um, before and after this committee uh, hearing as much as anything for the members and for the public. Nevada has unique opportunity to expand its clean energy economy, to do a, a handful of things, provide economic diversity, um, to create new high paying jobs, to increase le electric grid resiliency, and to provide new tax revenues to the state, all while decreasing carbon emissions and air pollution and increasing economic and environmental justice for Nevadans. Nevada is positioned to be a leader in clean energy. Think about this, we have almost no fossil fuels in the state. And so we're importing uh, all, almost all of our fossil energy, and that's more than $8 billion a year annually. What could we do with that money if it stayed right here in our economy? We have abundant renewable resources, some of the best solar and geothermal resources in the world, as well as wind and, and biomass opportunities. Um, we are located right in the center of the Western energy, uh, the Western grid, and right in the center of the Western energy market. We have existing transmission, uh, transmission infrastructure, uh, some of the most robust transmission infrastructure in the United States, right in Southern Nevada, right outside of Las Vegas, in the Mead Marketplace, El Dorado substations. Um, we're adjacent to the largest energy economy and the largest economic economy in all of North America. And we are, have the only operating lithium mine and, and, and some of the best lithium resources in the entire world, right here in Nevada. We have a well-established high-tech mining industry that uh, can capitalize on that. We have established 
labor unions and apprenticeship programs that have been built around the new energy economy. And we are leaders in the construction industry. If you've ever worked, seen uh, a casino be built on the Las Vegas Strip, you know that there, is about, there isn't about anything that we can't build and build quickly and build well. And we have universities and research facilities right here in the, in the state of Nevada that are set up around clean energy and the new energy economy. We have relatively new roads, rail and airports. We have relatively new transmission and distribution systems in Southern Nevada. And we are an international travel hub. We have easy business startups, no corporate income tax, and many programs to support energy projects. For all of these reasons, we should be the leader in the clean energy and the new energy economy here in the United States. This bill has several components. It has eight really key components uh, to support that vision. And, and the first one is a transmission infrastructure. The second one is transportation electrification. The third is energy efficiency, rooftop solar, resource planning to reduce carbon emissions, energy storage, economic development rate writer program, and then a few regulatory cleanup provisions that uh, we are providing in this bill. And, and we have with us today uh, Doug Cannon as well, from CE, the CEO of NV Energy, who will, who will go into a little bit greater detail on this. But the transmission infrastructure uh, opportunities we have in the state of Nevada are, are very uh, um, uh, important to the future, of the economic future of, of our state. Uh, transmission, if you look at the slide, the transmission, uh, high voltage bulk transmission system, uh, that serves the loads of the western um, grid, and that's the shaded part there that you see, the western part of the United States. Uh, there is a kind of obvious lack of, of um, transmission to connect all the dots, and that is basically in the center and western side of Nevada. And by building that out, we would be able to support the regional transmission markets. And if you could think about connecting those dots with the high voltage transmission lines in the West, we would be able to move uh, wind power that happens, for instance, at night in, in, the, in the mountain West. We'd be able to move that through in, into Nevada and through Nevada. We would be able to take advantage of zero carbon electricity generated in the Pacific Northwest in the, bon in the, in the hydro systems of Bonneville. And we could move that through and into Nevada. And then it would take advantage of surplus solar power in the Southwest and in California and move that into and through Nevada. And every time a megawatt hour moves through Nevada, whether we generated it here and exported it out, or it moves through our state from one utility to the next, Nevada gets economic benefit for that. And so we, because of the infrastructure we have in Southern Nevada, and because of the geographic location we have to existing transmission lines and future, and, and future projects that have been planned, if we just connect the dots with a few transmission lines, we could realize that economic opportunity of being the hub of the Western uh, grid. And we could realize the benefits that come with all of that energy that we could export and all that energy that we could move through our state. The benefits are billions of dollars of, of economic activity in our state and billions of dollars of private investment in our state in renewable energy projects. If you look at that, that, that um, slide that we have up right there and you look at the proposed uh, Green Link transmission lines, for instance, uh, they would access all of those renewable energy development zones, which are currently almost 100% federal lands. If we were to access those federal lands, we could turn those into areas that could be then be developed into clean energy projects, as well as load projects, whether it be data centers or uh, manufacturing or any other type of heavy industrial loads, mining. We could turn it into all, we could open up the opportunities for all of that for um, uh, development in our state. And we would be then turning what's now federal lands into um, a, a local a taxable property that the benefit of the tax would go to the local um, governments where these projects exist and to the state, as well as to the economic activities that we create with all those jobs. There's also 690, just in these lines, direct economic activity just from the construction of the, of the lines themselves. And if we go to the next slide, please. It also gives us the benefit of being able to take advantage of a regional transmission uh, organization. And a regional transmission organization, you, you can maybe the most uh, um, 
um, common one that we're aware of here in Nevada is the CAISO and the Cal in California. And, and Nevada has, is home to the only non-CAISO utility in all of the United States. And so we already have a, a good head start on, on uh, the world of regional uh, markets, but there's a lot of conversation across the Western United States about what a regional market should look like. And um, as we are sitting here in this committee room, um, hearing Senate Bill 448, my friend Senator Chris Hansen in Colorado is moving his Senate bill that, that talks about regionalization in the very same terms that we talk about it in this bill um, across, through the California House, or excuse me, the Colorado House. And um, this is a Western conversation taking place between Western governors, and I hope uh, uh, Director Bob Sian talks about that a little bit, but it's taking place between Western governors and it's taking place between all the, the big utilities and small utilities in the West, and it's taking place at the legislative level. And the benefits of an RTO is it, it, it spreads out both generation and load across a large regional area. And the benefits of that are resiliency. Um, I, I see transmission as a national security issue. And if we build out more transmission and we build out more storage and we integrate it into other systems, I think it makes, it makes Nevada's uh, place in, in the uh, national security apparatus even more important. And it builds out and it creates resiliency in a way that we don't see what happened in Texas happen in, in Nevada. And you know we get to a, a situation where we get very, very close to, to maxing out our system and not having the, res not having the availability of, of uh, electricity um, on some of our super peak times. And, and, and it's happened and we you know, saw through deregulation and lack of resource and lack of, of, of transmission assets 20, oh yeah, 20 years ago, what, what can happen with the Western energy crisis. But we also have seen what happened in California just this last summer. And that was, uh, not necessarily a lack of resource, it was a lack of access to the resource when they needed the most. And transmission helps that happen, helps that problem go away. So it also does something, I think one of the most important things being able to be in a regional market can do, and uh, the, the, the energy imbalance market is, is really a good example of that. And, and hopefully um, uh, Mr. Cannon can speak to that a, a little bit as well. It provides access to lower cost energy. So if you just look at the loads in the state of Nevada, which are primarily centered in two little pockets, and then you try to, to just uh, provide the, the generation for those loads, especially zero carbon generation for those loads, it, it's far more affordable if you have the entire Western United States to be able to access those markets. And, and so as we build out regional markets across the West, and regional markets exist in, 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 in everything east of the Rockies right now, but if, if we built out regional markets in the West and we built some transmission that would start, laid the groundwork for the, the network of transmission lines necessary to really make that happen, we increase resiliency, we increase national security, but we lower the cost of energy for Nevada's ratepayers. And, and it's a significant opportunity. So while we have to make investments in infrastructure, it opens up opportunities for those who are uh, serviced by Envy Energy, but also those who procure their own energy. They then have transmission options, and therefore they have access to clean energy at a lower price and to the benefit of all ratepayers, large and small. And that brings me to the next uh, uh, topic in, in this bill, in Senate Bill 448, and that's transportation electrification. Transportation electrification has the opportunity to not only uh, clean up air pollution that disproportionately affects uh, the communities in our, in our state that are historically underserved, but it also um, it, it has the opportunity to reduce our largest sector of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation, because we've done such a good job with uh, renewable energy and lowering our carbon emissions through the electricity sector, the transportation sector is the largest greenhouse gas emitter and the largest emitter in, of, of pollution in our state. Uh, pollution that causes uh, uh, health problems for our, many of our uh, Nevadans, especially um, those who are from communities that are historically underserved, and causes billions of dollars of health damages as a result. Um, transportation electrification also provides the opportunity to give choices to consumers. Right now, uh, we are at a tipping point where an electric vehicle uh, is the same price as its uh, gasoline engine counterpart. 
and is getting cheaper every day. And uh, we, to the cost of operating and owning an electric vehicle is already a fraction of what it is for uh, a gasoline engine vehicle. So personal transportation and public transportation are really uh, very good candidates to be electrified. And, and Nevada, believe it or not, sitting up here in western uh, Nevada, up in, in rural parts of Nevada, you, it's hard to imagine, but Nevada is one of the most uh, urban states in the entire United States. If you think about where you know 80% of the population of the state lives, they are clustered very closely in two valleys here in the state. Well, that creates a lot of air pollution, but it also makes even the lowest cost and uh, um, shortest range electric vehicles a good choice for, for the majority of Nevadans. And longer ranges are coming every day and cheaper prices are coming every day. But uh, that own, those health benefits and those greenhouse gas emissions benefits and those economic benefits for, for all Nevadans only exist if you can charge your vehicle. Right now, you know, I have an electric vehicle charger in my garage and an electric vehicle in my garage and a battery system and a solar system and all the stuff. But there are so many Nevadans, as a matter of fact, most Nevadans who don't have access to that. And so if we want to make the benefits of electrification available to all Nevadans, we need to provide charging infrastructure for that. And another benefit of providing charging infrastructure is when you um, have charging infrastructure and you're charging these electric vehicles, you are creating a load that then um, uh, spreads out the cost of not just electric vehicle charging, but all electricity in the entire state across a broader base. And so, you know, more units um, and, and you get lower prices. And so there's been quite a bit of, of, of data that shows and, and quite a bit of studies that show that electrification of transportation provides downward rate pressure for all ratepayers, including those who don't have electric vehicles. And so that's another uh, benefit of, of electrification. And it would save, uh, according to um, a, a study that just was commissioned, uh, it would save by MJ Bradley and Associates, this is a, a new study from 2021, um, that the cumulative net benefits by 2050 for the electrification of the transportation sector could be $21 billion. And most of that comes in driver savings. And uh, you know, the cost of kilowatt hours have gone nothing but gone down here in the state of Nevada, all while the makeup of the kilowatt hour has gotten cleaner and cleaner and cleaner every year. And the kilowatt hour, the electricity that you buy, that is what drives your, your that is the fuel for your electric vehicle. So imagine a world where in Nevada, we are making all of our own energy or most of our own uh, electricity, excuse me, with renewable resources. We're putting them in our vehicles and we're driving our vehicles. That closes the loop and keeps billions of dollars in our economy and also makes it far more affordable for the individual who's driving the electric vehicle. This bill addresses that and it, it does this um, through, through uh, two different ways. Um, for the purposes of, of just trying to lay the groundwork and getting out in front of this wave of electric vehicles coming our way. And, you know, I always say that since the, I watched the Super Bowl this year and uh, not a particularly um, enjoyable game, but um, the commercials were awesome as they usually are. And the MVP of the Super Bowl this year were electric vehicles. And every major manufacturer and then new startups every day um, are going to be making new uh, electric vehicles. And um, if we don't get out in front of that, um, we are going to miss out on some of those benefits. And so we decided that, that there's two different ways in this bill that, that we wanted to approach this. One was immediate. Get out there, make immediate investments, put people to work, get some tax revenues happening in the state of Nevada, and, and, and start laying the groundwork so that, that we can get in front of this um, uh, wave of electric vehicles that will be coming to our state. And, and then the second part would be put in place a long-term planning process by which the community can come together and we can all start talking about what the electrification of transportation looks like in a more holistic way. But the first piece um, has five different types of programs and, and we're directing the investment of $100 million in, in transportation electrification uh, during uh, the next two years. And that comes in five different programs. Interstate corridor charging depots, um, that is to uh, facilitate um, long, long uh, distance travel within our state, but also to give travelers into our state 
the comfort that they can come from out of state and visit Nevada and stay and enjoy all the great things we have to offer in Nevada and leave some of their dollars behind um, and, and charging infrastructure in, in the interstate corridors help them do that. Urban charging depots. Uh, we need to have the ability to have folks uh, be able to find places to charge their vehicles in the core of, of our cities. And public agency charging, uh, school buses, fleets, um, there is it, the, 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 one of the prime kind of um, candidates for electrification is school buses. Uh, you know, they park, they park a certain amount of hours every day and then they have a certain set route that they go on. But, you know, our schools are, are in, in a situation right now where funding is, is they have to prioritize where they put their funding. So if we can put charging infrastructure to help those, those school districts, when we know that there's some availability there for um, uh, uh, help to get school buses, I think we can see the electrification of, of our school bus fleet. And that is a direct impact to the children who are riding on those school buses and the neighborhoods that they serve. And then we have uh, um, the last is outdoor recreation and tourism. And this one I'm kind of, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited about that in, in because when you think about uh, coming to, this, to, to Nevada and you think about, and I'll use Las Vegas as an example, you come to Las Vegas and you drive into Las Vegas and, and a lot of our, our, our guests are coming into Las Vegas. And a lot of our guests come to Las Vegas from California. If you have the urban charging depot, I mean, excuse me, the interstate corridor charging depots, and then you have uh, charging um, opportunities in the co resort corridors, not only are you making it uh, a more affordable and convenient way for folks to visit our resort corridors and our outdoor um, recreation areas but you are helping those employees that live in or that work in the the charging or excuse me in the resort corridor um, that is our largest employer by far and those folks that work in those resort corridors if you could charge your electric vehicle at work then you don't necessarily even need to have a charging uh, station at or near your home and so that's that's as somebody who Who's, who's tried to live this and, and experiment with it and, and see where the shortfalls are in our state, I think that's about the number one way we can help folks um, uh, have access to electric vehicles. And so what we do is we, it, within that $100 million investment, um, it directs 40% of that must be invested in historically underserved uh, communities to the benefit of historically underserved communities. And that is is to uh, to do two things it's it's to it's to really try to address the issue of the um, disproportional negative impacts that those communities have experienced from both um, uh, climate change and also and more immediate um, their health the health uh, problems associated with some of the historically underserved communities and and, and the pollution that we have in our valleys and then it also, it, the second thing that it does is it tries to make um, economic opportunities available um, and, and whether it be through low cost um, charging or uh, having access to, to charging at, at their home or place of work to those same communities. Um, time and again, we kind of see those communities uh, aren't the beneficiary of the, of the new energy economy and we're trying to, to make uh, opportunities exist for those communities by, or by, by directing 40% of all funding to the benefit of those communities. And then it also directs 20% of the investment must be invested in the outdoor recreation and tourism program, which is again, uh, I think the most important uh, way that we can help our economy recover and we can also benefit uh, the employees and uh, visitors in, into our resort corridor. Uh, the second piece of the, the, this is, is that long and comprehensive um, and holistic approach to planning around electrification of transportation. And then one of the other components of this bill is energy efficiency. Uh, current law requires that 5% of energy efficiency, um, an energy efficiency plan expenditures be directed to programs for low income households. What this does is this doubles that amount and it doubles it to the benefit of low income uh, households, but also um, these historically underserved communities that we've identified and defined in this bill. And uh, I just want to, you know, give a shout out to Chispa and uh, NRDC, who really were helpful over the last year in coming up with definitions and and applications for those historically uh, um, underserved communities. And 
and energy efficiency programs with variable incentive levels will have to offer higher incentive levels, incentive levels for low income households. Again, trying to help Nevadans um, economically and, and through the health and, 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 and climate benefits of energy efficiency, help the, the communities that are sometimes left behind in, in these types of, of projects. And then what this does is it, 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 it really clarifies and expands rooftop solar for multi-unit buildings, specifically in, in the intent, the intent of this and, and the, uh, is to address multifamily housing, specifically low income and senior housing. And I'll use my grandma as an example, who lives in a, a senior housing in, in North Las Vegas. And you, you have one owner of a, of a large senior housing uh, or, or low income housing um, development, and it's all included, the energy, the water, everything comes with the rent. And in that particular um, application, we wanna be able to be have solar on the roofs or parking structures in my grandma's case of that type of a building so that that folks who, who they, not only do they not own their own place, they don't even have their own power bill, but we want them to be able to get the benefit of uh, on-site renewable energy generation and also the uh, economic benefits that, that come with that would be directly passed on to those, uh, those tenants. And then w one of the other components of this bill is resource planning to reduce carbon emissions. We're all very, uh, in this legislature, very um, familiar with the renewable portfolio standard, which is a mandate that we make a certain amount of our, our electricity from a certain type of clean energy. Well, I think we are moving beyond that as a, as a, a state and, and really as a, as a energy sector, and we're moving towards a zero carbon future. And how do we get to a zero carbon future? Well, a zero carbon future takes a long-term plan and we need to start making that plan now. We've done amazing things and, and this graph up there will show you if you look at the CO2 emissions reduction, which is, is the biggest uh, contributor to carbon in the electricity sector, look at those CO2 emission reductions all while our population has grown. That is a result right there of the RPS policies put in place as well as, and probably even more importantly, the falling costs of renewable energy. Renewable energy is now the cheapest energy. And so all of those things make sense, but now we have to figure out how do we get to where we wanna go? We wanna get to a zero carbon electrical uh, electricity world, and it takes a little bit more planning than just the RPS. And so the RPS was a great tool to get us to where we're at, and the next level is to start putting in plans on how we get to, to zero carbon. And sometimes that, that means transmission, sometimes that means storage, sometimes that means entering into a regional market, and sometimes that means um, uh, electric, uh, electrification of the transportation sector. All of those things help us drive down the cost of electricity and access our zero carbon future. And then this is uh, probably my favorite slide in this entire um, uh, deck. You take a look at uh, the, the, the increased use of, of renewable energy and the, the reduction in carbon and overlaid with the, um, the average rates. And so as, as the reduction in carbon and, the, and, the, and the, the generation of renewable energy grows, the cost of electricity has fallen. And this is, this is you know, um, <laughs> somebody who's been coming in this building 20 years preaching this and, 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 and had three uh, sessions under my belt just really trying to push this policy. It is good to see that, um, well, it's good to say I told you so, because there were so many people that continue to say, when we, to, to adopt these policies just raises prices. That this could not be further from the truth. And so this uh, slide right here is, is probably my favorite slide. I think I will blow it up and hang it on my wall. And, and so this is really how these all come together. When we talk about, um, when we look at kind of the, the plan that, that based on the, the laws that currently exist and the requirements that we currently have for our utilities in this state, when we look at what that, that carbon reduction model looks like, not only is it not enough to get us to the goals that we have set for ourselves as a, as a state and as a nation and, and, and largely as, as a planet, it is, uh, uh, it could be far better 
And that's why we need to go from our current kind of way of look at resource planning and renewable portfolio standard and take a more holistic approach at carbon reduction planning for the electricity sector. And one of the other opportunities we have here in the state, and I, I, I spoke to it earlier, but it, about lithium, for instance, and but there's storage comes in a lot of different ways. Storage comes in lithium. Uh, it comes in mechanical uh, storage. It comes in pumped hydro. It comes in, in in hydrogen. There's a lot of ways to store energy, and um, we need to make sure that we are encouraging all of those ways here in the state of Nevada. And we could be uh, again the leader in, in energy storage here in the state. And um, and and we want to one of the ways we want to incentivize that is by making a, changing our renewable energy tax abatement program to clarify that some of these large storage projects that are that are coupled with or facilitate renewable energy generation are part of that renewable energy tax abatement, and so um, that's one of the things that we do here in the bill. And then um, the, the the last. Uh, economic development piece in this bill. And this bill really is an economic development bill. We can reach our, our climate reduction goals, but we can do it while we're develop economic, developing the economy, is reopening the economic development electric rate rider program. And this is for new load in Southern Nevada. And so we've had this available for years and we used it. You're probably um, uh, most familiar with how we used it up here up north um, and how we wanted to make it available down south. And then that, that statute just ran out. And we have all kinds of companies that want to come to Southern Nevada and that would be electricity intensive companies. And what this does is this makes it just a, a little bit more competitive environment for those companies to locate themselves to Southern Nevada, to Nevada, but primarily Southern Nevada in that this exact model was used in Northern Nevada to great success. The, and the last thing um, that we have in this bill or what I consider to be regulatory kind of cleanups. And one is the disposition of generation assets. And this goes, this goes way back uh, to um, the, uh, the, the when, when Sierra Pacific Power Company and Envy Energy and, and, um, and then, excuse me, Nevada Power uh, came together uh, doing business as Envy Energy. This, the merger um, has some uh, language that needs to be cleaned up that would, that would clarify some issues. And then, and then the last one is if we're, going to, if we're going to propose that the utility spend um, uh, money to, to build infrastructure out, we need to make sure that when that utility builds that infrastructure out, they are doing it with the highest level of scrutiny from the regulator. And so this public utilities burden of proof language would really make sure that the, the burden is on the utility to show that their investment that they're making is the most prudent investment for the benefit of the ratepayer. And that is the bill in a nutshell. And um, so with that, I, I, I want to turn it over to, um, uh, with the chair's uh, indulgence, uh, uh, Mr. Doug Cannon from um, uh, NV Energy and for a few brief remarks. And, and, and Mr. Cannon, you're willing to access any of these slides that B Bob could, could uh, uh, um, tee up for you. And then um, after that uh, will be a Director Bob Cian. So I'm gonna step away and let Mr. Cannon have a seat. Good afternoon, Chair Harris, uh, Doug Cannon, uh, C-A-N-N-O-N. -N -N. Uh, honored to be here today, and I appreciate the uh, committee and the chair taking a, a few minutes to visit about what is an important piece of legislation for Nevada. Uh, as I introduced myself before, I'm Doug Cannon, President and CEO of Envy Energy, and uh, appreciate the invitation from Senator Brooks and others today to testify on Senate Bill 448. Uh, this bill really does continue the legacy that began before, as, as Senator Brooks talked about. In particular, back in 2019, a, a legacy where the new energy economy started to take root and where we started to really develop Nevada's renewable energy potential, focus on reducing carbon, and focused on creating jobs and driving economic diversification in our state. The timing could not be uh, more succinct here 
with the effects of COVID-19 still challenging all of our communities and the opportunity that lies ahead to create jobs and further diversify our economy. I do want to take a moment to thank Senator Brooks for bringing this important piece of legislation forward. I also want to thank Governor Sisolak and Director Bobzine and all of the stakeholders who have provided input on this bill and for their leadership on carbon reduction, renewable energy development, and job creation. I would like to begin today by talking about transmission infrastructure. Transmission infrastructure in the electric industry is really akin to the interstate highway system or the interstate railway system. We can produce energy in a lot of places in Nevada, but that doesn't do us any good if we can't get that energy from where it's produced to where it needs to be utilized. And transmission becomes the backbone that is necessary to fully utilize that energy. Earlier this year, the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada did approve the first segment of what we call the GreenLink Nevada Transmission Project. That's the map that you see up on the screen right now. You can see it consists of actually five different segments of transmission lines. The Public Utilities Commission of Nevada approved construction, design, full development of what we refer to as GreenLink West. That's a line that goes from Las Vegas up to Yarrington, up the west side of the state of Nevada. The, then in addition, there are two lines that run from Yarrington. Uh, one runs over into the Innovation Park or, or the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center, and then another runs over into Reno to actually get that energy to where the loads are. Uh, in addition, GreenLink Nevada also consists of what we call GreenLink North which is a line that runs from Ely across kind of the center of the state over to Yarrington as well. That particular line segment was not approved for construction. That was approved for some preliminary design and preliminary planning, but again, not construction. It ultimately takes this whole suite of lines to make the triangle that you see up on the, the screen to create the transmission network that's really needed to unlock the opportunities that we see in our, in our state and in front of us. What would the, com the completion of GreenLink do for our state? Well, it's really a vital component for our state and to position our state to achieve our long-term sustainability and carbon reduction goals. The construction and in service of these lines unlocks the potential to develop more than 4,000 megawatts of new renewable energy across the state of Nevada. In some of our rural counties, this creates very important jobs and represents significant economic development. It also creates a path forward for us to economically achieve the state's net zero carbon goals by 2050. GreenLink Nevada adds much needed transmission import capacity into Northern Nevada, which is necessary to accommodate more than 1400 megawatts of load that has signed up to come to Nevada and needs that, that transmission capacity in order to meet their needs. That's, that's exciting. That 1400 megawatts represents significant business development in our state, significant employment opportunity in this state, and those are contracts that we have signed. Those are not just the theoretical customers coming to our state. And it allows these employers to come to our state and achieve these objectives in a carbon free way, utilizing Nevada's renewable resources. These projects also facilitate Nevada's long held vision to leverage the state's renewable energy resources to not only meet the needs of Nevadans, but to also create opportunities for revenue by exporting this uh, energy and creating jobs uh, by exporting the energy to surrounding states through the increased transfer capability that will be created by GreenLink. In addition, as mentioned by Senator Brooks, it increases our ability to participate in the energy imbalance market, which further brings benefits to Nevadans. I will mention any benefits that are received by NV Energy participating in the energy imbalance market go 100% to our customers. Envy Energy does not keep any of those benefits as profit. And so every dollar that we can save by participating in the energy imbalance market is another dollar that our customers save off of their energy rates. 
as uh, pointed out by Senator Brooks, the Green Link Nevada Transmission Project is about a $2.5 billion investment in Nevada. It will generate over $690 million in direct economic activity, and it creates nearly 4,000 good paying, skilled labor jobs to further drive diversification of Nevada's economy and drive recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now development, permitting and construction of high voltage transmission is a lengthy endeavor that must begin immediately in order for us to meet the economic reliability and clean energy objectives of the state while ensuring that facilities have minimal impact on Nevada's lands, resources, and habitat. If this bill is passed, NV Energy will file an amendment with the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada by September 1st to construct the facilities previously approved for design permitting and land acquisition, that being primarily GreenLink North. Now, an obvious question is what is the effect on customer rates from building a project like GreenLink? Since 2013, Envy Energy has undertaken a significant amount of capital investment in the state of Nevada. In fact, since 2013, we have deployed more than $4.3 billion in capital investment. What was the effect of that $4.3 billion in investment on our customers' rates? Those rates are lower today than they were in 2009. In October of 2020, or of 2020, our customers received a $120 million rate credit. And then on January 1st of 2021, our customers saw a $93 million rate reduction. Our customers have not seen a rate reduction, or excuse me, a rate increase since before 2013. The capital that we're talking about here is even a smaller number than that. We expect this to unlock significant renewable energy opportunities those lower customers cost today, as Senator Brooks uh, indicated. We also believe and have seen that this will unlock the opportunity to utilize market resources throughout the region, which will also help reduce our customers' rates. I also want to note that the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada reviews all of the costs for these projects that NV Energy undertakes and only allows NV Energy to recover the reasonable costs of these projects. Thus, customers have assurance that NV Energy is being closely watched and regulated as it develops these projects. GreenLink Nevada will bring to Nevada lower cost renewable energy resources, will open up new energy markets to Nevada to access lower cost resources, and will allow NV Energy to manage its energy portfolio in a more cost effective and reliable way. All benefits that reduce overall costs for our energy customers throughout this state. Another important section of today's legislation addresses the electrification of the transportation sector. To meet the climate objectives of Nevada and specifically reduce carbon in the transportation sector, the role of the electric utility must expand to accelerate transportation electrification. Today, tailpipe emissions are the largest source of carbon in Nevada, and NV Energy has long supported cleaner transportation opportunities. The Transportation Electrification Economic Recovery Package that's included in this legislation authorizes up to $100 million of clean energy infrastructure investment in electric vehicle charging stations and other infrastructure over the next three years. It directs NV Energy to file a plan with the Public Utilities Commission and upon review and approval by the Public Utility Commission to make these immediate investments to accelerate transportation electrification, to put people to work, and especially to do this in historically underrepresented communities. Work would begin immediately on these programs outlined in the legislation so that we can begin uh, to see that all important economic recovery. In, in sum, this bill transforms Nevada's clean energy economy and its clean energy landscape. This bill drives the clean energy economy for Nevada and positions Nevada as an energy leader in the Western United States for decades to come. The bill accomplishes these objectives while also ensuring low income and underrepresented Nevadans enjoy the benefits of this energy transformation. In addition, this bill creates thousands of good paying, skilled labor jobs that diversify Nevada's economy and job market. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today and urge your support of Senate Bill 448. And uh, 
Chair Harris, if I could have uh, Director Bob Sian from the Governor's Office of Energy um, go uh, and provide a few words of testimony. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Chair Harris. Uh, my name is David Bob Sian, and I serve as the uh, Director of the Governor's Office of Energy. I'd like to thank uh, Senator Brooks for his introduction of SB 448 and for the invitation to join the presentation uh, this afternoon. Uh, now that you've heard the bill presentation, I'd like to highlight particular areas of support for the administration in alignment with uh, the Nevada Climate Strategy. Uh, as Senator Brooks mentioned, uh, in December of 2019, Governor Sisolak joined a convening with other governors to discuss the future of the Western grid with a focus on price stability and reliability for customers economic opportunity and increased adoption of renewable energy, all while facing uh, the pressures and impacts of a changing climate uh, in the West. That convening of governors uh, from states as diverse as Idaho, Colorado, Oregon, Arizona, Wyoming, and others uh, has evolved into the Western Interconnection Regional Electricity Dialogue or WIRED initiative and consists of governors, energy advisors, and utility representatives uh, developing recommendations on Number one, resource adequacy. Two, transmission planning. Uh, and I'm the co-chair of that of that particular group. And number three, greenhouse gas accounting and state clean energy standards, uh, seeking to harmonize those uh, for purposes of, of market engagement. Uh, Nevada is also participating in a multi-state study funded by the Department of Energy of the costs and benefits of joining various configurations of an RTO. So the timing of this legislation couldn't be better as the state's current engagements and regional dialogues will provide plenty of inputs for further exploration by the Regional Transmission Coordination Task Force. GOE looks forward to supporting the task force and has a history of providing such support uh, to other similar efforts. Next, I want to focus on uh, the RITA expansion uh, to include storage. Uh, expanding the Renewable Energy Tax Abatement Program to include storage is a logical next step uh, in Nevada's long history of policies supportive of growing the clean energy economy. Uh, for reference, GOE approved its first solar plus storage uh, RITA project in January of, of this year. Uh, with the identification of storage as a critical technology for Nevada to meet its zero carbon emission goals uh, in the power sector, GOE expects to see additional applications uh, that will include storage. This expansion of RITA uh, will support developers in considering storage uh, in their projects, all to the benefits that uh, Senator Brooks laid out. I next want to turn to transportation electrification. Uh, Senator Brooks is, is certainly uh, the most powerful advocate uh, for the need and the opportunity around transportation electrification. And we look forward to participating uh, in the development of the plans. Uh, GOE has had a successful partnership with MB Energy for the development of EV charging infrastructure since 2015. And we look forward to continuing this work through the legislation. I want to particularly highlight uh, Section 39.3C, which is the Public Agency Electric Vehicle Charging Program, and that requires the utility to co collaborate with the Departments of Administration, Conservation and Natural Resources, Transportation, and GOE in developing the program. I'm pleased to support, uh, pleased to report uh, that these agencies are already discussing with MB Energy their plans for this program uh, and, and others. So this collaboration will be enormously helpful uh, in the ultimate success in the plan and those investments, particularly when it comes to maximizing any additional infrastructure support that may, came, that may come from Washington, D.C. as part of the American Jobs Plan. And as noted, as the EV market grows, we want to ensure that all Nevadans have access to clean transportation by supporting the development of infrastructure uh, for frontline communities. By ensuring not, that not less than 40% of this bill's of the bill's TE plan uh, be dedicated to investments made in or for the benefits of historically underserved community communities, SB 448 expands opportunities to access uh, the EV market for all Nevadans. And so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you, Chair Harris and members of the committee. That concludes my remarks. And Chair Harris, if I may, um, we have uh, Director Brown and Mr. Potts from the Governor's Office of Economic Development and uh, provide a few words. Uh, Director Thank Brown. Thank you, Senator. 
Thank you, Senator Michael Brown. I'm executive director of uh, the governor's office of economic development. In the governor's state of the state speech, he said he would work with Senator Brooks uh, to bring landmark legislation uh, to pass a bold and urge the legislature to pass a bold energy bill to solidify our competitive position in the transmission, storage, and distribution of energy. Uh, this legislation meets that test, and we we urge its adoption. Uh, the governor also has stressed that this. This legislation will help create jobs, jobs, and jobs. 20 years ago this month, in this very hearing room, the lights were going out across Nevada. We were suffering from the uh, California energy crisis triggered by uh, the Enron speculation, and Nevada legislators in a bipartisan way, Senator Townsend and Majority Leader Buckley, uh, came together to fashion energy legislation that stabilized our markets and set the pathway for a renewable new economy. And, and we can't have a hearing like this without mentioning Rose McKinney James and the key role she played in putting solar on the agenda at that time. And I was there, and I remember at the time, we thought it was going to be wind, and Rose was right. And like I say, they, they came together in that crisis and enacted this and stabilized us. Today's Wall Street Journal has a very interesting article in it. It says that for the first time, renewable energy and renewable energy storage is actually becoming more competitive than natural gas. This entire storage industry, which lithium is a base of, is, for, is coming together, and it's coming together here in Nevada. Um, this landmark legislation that Senator Brooks has brought, uh, 448, I think 448 will be one of those bill numbers that leads on, lives on uh, beyond legislative sessions. Climate change is real. Corporate America has recognized it's real. Climate change is on the agenda of companies in Nevada. Climate change is on the agenda of companies considering coming to Nevada. But to meet the challenge of climate change, you have to have the metrics. You have to know what's going into your factory, into your mine, into your casino. You can't manage what you can't measure. Wall Street has stepped forward and has forced, compelled, encouraged, uh, mandated that companies start to come forward with ESG goals, environmental, social governance goals. And this is how you can measure how companies are doing in this area. And most progressive companies and most responsible companies are now seeking ways to improve their ESG scores. By creating uh, this kind of green energy in Nevada and maximizing our opportunities in this area, we really do have the opportunity to attract a different kind of manufacturer to the state um, that can produce um, more jobs than just what this energy bill will produce, uh, long-term sustaining jobs. American manufacturing is in a bit of a reshuffle. They're looking at, re in the post-pandemic period, they're looking at reshuffling uh, operations, reshoring operations from overseas. They're looking at reshuffling operations in the United States to uh, sort out their supply chain issues and e-commerce issues that developed in the pandemic. And we're meeting with them along with our regional economic development directors. Nevada's an attractive prospect for them because of our Pacific time zone location and, and because of uh, a ready and hard work labor force um, that, that wants uh, are looking for those kinds of jobs. But we also have an advantage in energy. And for the first time, I can we, we sat with a manufacturer from the Midwest a few weeks ago, and they looked at us, and the first question they had for us was they wanted to talk about renewable energy. They wanted to know how, how we were producing it, how it was transmitted, what the prices were. Um, that's that's a game changer. We've not we've not had that before, and uh, and so this is this is really an opportunity uh, to help build and diversify the Nevada economy. The SRI plan, which is an independent assessment uh, done for GoEd by SRI International on resiliency and recovery in Nevada, recommended that we take every step we could to solidify our position. As as a leader in renewable energy, as a, re a leader in, in this uh, sustainable uh, energy storage area. So we would urge enactment of this legislation. We're pleased to see that the energy rider has been provided for it. That will help us incentivize companies um, to come to the state. Uh, my, my good colleague, Bob Potts, uh, will walk through uh, some of the economic numbers associated with this legislation. And, and thank you for, for having me today.
Thank you, Director Brown, and uh, thank you, Chair Harris, and members of the Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure. It's really great to be here to, uh, with the opportunity to testify in support of SB 448. Um, for the record, my name is Bob Potts. I'm the Deputy Director in the North of the Governor's Office of Economic Development. And I would like to first, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple things, uh, talk about the economic opportunities of the GreenLink project, and then provide kind of a brief overview of the current business development activities outlining the importance of this project to economic development and diversification in our state. Um, I will keep my comments short, but I just want to reemphasize a couple of the numbers that were brought out earlier in, in, in this meeting. Uh, these, a lot of these were provided by my fellow economists and our advisors over at Applied Analysis. I've worked with those folks over, gosh, two, three decades now on all sorts of economic impact analysis, trust their work, think they do great work. Uh, and I want to talk about those a little bit about uh, the economic impact of this GreenLink project over the construction period of the transmission infrastructure. Um, during this 12-year construction period, the project is expected to generate $690 million in economic activity and support over 3,700 person-year jobs during this construction period. Um, those jobs are going to pay over $406 million in wages and salaries, so, and all of those dollars get spun off back into the economy again. The construction phase, if you just look at the construction phase, that pencils out to over $1.44 return on investment. So every dollar that's invested in this returns $1.44 on the initial in, uh, investment that Nevada makes in this project. Um, that does not take into account some of the things that Mr. Cannon was talking about, things like export based selling energy, energy imbalance, uh, being able to manage those those kind of things. And it does not include the indirect and induced spin out effects that are expected to add an additional 211 million in economic activity through the project's development cycle. Um, we're not even talking about export based or energy imbalance. That brings the ROI up to a dollar 88. Okay, so for every dollar invested, a dollar 88 comes back. Um, but from economic development's perspective, and what we've seen with Nevada's economy, and particularly the, uh, how hard Southern Nevada got hit during this last pandemic and the economic downturn as a result of this health crisis that we went through, um, it's become more and more apparent how we need to retool um, and diversify our economy to get us out of the cyclical cycle that we continue to find ourselves in. Um, we have a very strong pipeline and a lot of interest in the state, particularly in Southern Nevada. If I look back at our last two GOED abatement approval meetings, 80 to 90% of the companies that, uh, uh, that approached us were manufacturers. Manufacturers are high energy use uh, operations. And these are the folks that are going to come here and to give us the competitive edge against our competing states and other regions in the country um, this adds a uh, huge value to what we can do, especially when it's like uh, Director Brown was talking about. One of the first questions that come out of their mind is, out of their mouths is, what does Nevada's energy portfolio, renewable portfolio look like? It matters to companies, right? And we have a huge interest right now uh, in the manufacturing sector in our state. If I look at our business pipeline activity and I look at active projects in the state, we currently have 19 active projects. 14 of those are 75% of them are manufacturers, five of which are EV related. Okay, so it's this very tight linkage to everything that we're talking about here. 16 of the 19 or 86% of them are in Clark County. In total, these projects are estimated to bring on over 12,500 jobs at or above the state average wage and $9.7 billion in capital investment, okay, huge. Now, will all of these projects happen? Um, no, but uh, everything we can do to make them happen makes all the difference in the world and, 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 and addressing what we wanna be like uh, going forward in diversifying our economy. We also track the number of projects that are currently on hold. So we have a lot of companies that are still working through their projects where they want to go. And they're looking at different things and, 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 and looking at their cost portfolios. Uh, we have 14 of them that are on hold. Nine of them, or 64% of them, are manufacturers as well. 10 or 71% of them are also in Park County. In total, these estimated project or these projects are estimated to bring on 8,400 jobs at an average wage of over $25 an hour and bring in well over $1.9 in capital investment. 
And I know that CapEx number is low because, uh, because these are the on-hold projects. They're trying to figure this out, what they need for real estate equipment and all the rest of it. So that's a con very conservative number going there. So again, I want to emphasize what uh, Director Brown had mentioned uh, a little bit earlier. Of these 19 active projects, and in particular the man manufacturers, they have all asked us almost to accompany what Nevada's renewable energy portfolio looks like. And for us to be able to message what we're doing here would be, uh, would be huge strides for us moving forward. Um, so with that, I thank you, Chair Harris, and I will end my comments and open things up for questions that the committee might have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Harris, for, for allowing us to make this lengthy presentation. And with that, we can open up for questions. And um, with me today is, uh, is Bob Johnston, who I've worked with for many, many years and who's been in, uh, an expert in this space for, for uh, much, much longer than that. And uh, recently uh, was able to uh, join me um, and, and is the uh, uh, architect behind a lot of the language that's in this bill and has been working with me for the last six months on it. And so um, what questions that I can't answer, Bob will most certainly be able to. All right, thank you. Um, I have a few questions, but I'll, I'll save mine for, for last. Uh, Senator Hammond. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, no, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to ask a few questions. I, it, it, the bill's pretty big. Um, I wasn't going to say anything until uh, uh, Mr. Brown said, uh, you know, that we did, this is bold, and it is bold. Uh, I lament that it's, uh, you know, we're 14 days away from the end of the session where a lot of this stuff, I really wanted to dig in at the beginning and kind of get into it. I know some of it uh, was out of your hands, uh, but it, you know, because it's so large and it is so bold, there's a lot of people who've been calling me up since the language came out uh, with a lot of questions. Some of the questions way out there perhaps weren't really digging into the, the real root of what you're trying to get at. Uh, so I'll try, I'll ask a few, just a couple questions because I know some other people are going to ask as well. But I really wanted to get to, I think, the portion of the bill that deals with the PUC and especially with the, uh, um, the, the Green Link. Um, in the bill, it talks a, bit, a little bit about going to the PUC and saying, hey, when, when you have a request and the request, you know, check marks this, 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 and this, you know, as long as it hits those marks, you have to approve it. Can you kind of go through it so people understand a little bit more, even even I need probably a little bit more understanding of why you need to do something like that? Because the PUC, we, t we typically don't tie their hands. We allow them to sort of have that, that autonomy to deal with uh, the, the, the subject matter that they're good at. Um, and I'm sure it's going to probably dovetail into the rate payers uh, and I know you already referenced your and you don't have them numbered but so I don't know how to refer to it other than the fact that your favorite uh, slide in your deck uh, it'll probably dovetail back into that and, and what savings there is I think it's important to probably reiterate that to everybody you know the savings that are out there because I think that's important so I'll, I'll start with that question and I'll have another one afterwards uh, th uh, thank you Senator Hammond and and it uh, chair uh, through you to Senator. Um, you can go directly. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it, it, it's, I, I first want to start with saying that we work very closely with the Bureau of Consumer Protection, with uh, the Public Utilities Commission, with um, uh, the Electric Utility and V Energy, with um, um, environmental and, and economic and, or social and environmental justice groups, uh, conservation groups, and, and, and it, folks in the energy industry. Over, over the last year, um, this is a bill that, that, that largely was, uh, came into existence summer of last year. And we worked very closely with them, including the Public Utilities Commission, to, to try to make sure that we were addressing the right balance of policy initiative and ratepayer protection. And, and so the, the reason that, that this bill is maybe a little more prescriptive than, than you, you would generally see in a piece of legislation on something that, that you're right usually is a plan that's proposed and then it's debated in, 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 in front of the Public Utilities Commission, that what this plan does is this plan lays out a roadmap for the, the, for the future of Nevada. And it lays out a roadmap that says that if we build these transmission lines and we do this electrical um, infrastructure for charging, we, all these wonderful things will happen. And, and, and I feel that we have data, and, and, and Mr. Potts and Mr. Brown uh, alluded to some of that data, and then a lot of the folks, and, 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 and Mr. Cannon as well, and MV Energy, and 
that you know these wonderful things will happen economically for our state if we build these these do these things but the the regulator the public utilities commission that is not their job to to they are not in the economic development business they are not they are in the keep uh uh rates low keep the lights on and make sure that the the utility when they make an investment does it in the most prudent fashion possible they aren't they don't have it within their ability to to contemplate what the economic benefit is um, outside of just keeping the lights on. And so this so the regulator, it's it's not necessarily their job to contemplate all these things that we we feel will happen and have data that that supports it. Um, they they don't have the ability in their 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 charter to be able to contemplate those things and, and analyze that. And so that's why this is a policy decision um, uh, for the state of Nevada that we want to do these things to lay the groundwork for things well beyond um, just keeping the lights on and, and, and being able to uh, reliably provide electricity. And that's what really they're, they're there to regulate. And so that's why this does make those directions. And, um, but at the same time, gives the, the, the commission all of the tools necessary to make sure that when the utility does these things that we're directing them to do, they're doing it in the absolute most cost-effective manner possible. So if I, if I could, Senator, um, you know, a lot of it comes back to sort of the bureaucratic model. You know, we, we give an agency a parameter to work in. We say this is, you know, th this is your box, and they get really good at it. I'm, I'm not going to be derogatory towards bureaucratic agencies. I mean, that's, you know, Max Weber talks about it a lot. He, he says that we build in efficiencies when we tell them this is exactly how to do your job. And so we give them that, that the parameter. But what you're saying is this, this is kind of one of those instances where we as the legislature are directing a sort of policy change and we sort of have to give them direction because you're going to we're asking them to work outside their box and uh, and so that way we can actually um, institute these these new changes but I guess what I'm trying to get at is and, and I think you've said it once and it's all right to reiterate it it by giving them the new direction you believe that this bill and the green link and the jobs and the uh, the flow of energy through our state and the new structure of our energy um, economy um, warrants that this, this is not that you're basically saying that this is a policy decision and it actually is going to lower the rates eventually as you described in your favorite uh, your favorite slide I, am I correct in saying that yes I, I think you've described it um, perfectly and and that that is is the intent of the bill and and um, but it's not necessarily um, in in the uh, wheelhouse or in the responsibility more than anything of the Public Utilities Commission to even contemplate what private investment in the state would look like if we built a transmission line. Does it, do we need to build it tomorrow to keep the lights on today? That is, that is their job. And, and if so, how can you do it in the lowest cost possible? That is their job. And this goes well beyond that because this lays out a, a gr some groundwork for economic development for our state. Uh, thank you. I think that that's good for the record right now. And so I'll ask one more question, then I'll get, turn it back over to the chair because I know other people probably want to ask um, on the committee. Um, it, it has been mentioned, uh, and, and I could go a lot of different directions. I have a lot of thoughts here. Again, 14 days out, bold, a lot of stuff in here. We could go on and on. Um, so you talk about storage, that, and that, that, that this is probably the one part of the bill that uh, is really – not in my wheelhouse. I don't know a lot about this. I just know what I keep hearing. I mean, we keep seeing uh, stories come up about uh, you know, um, safety issues when we're talking about battery storage. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to kind of get an idea uh, where we are with battery storage, uh, the, the, the energy storage in batteries, I suppose. Where are we with that? And, and can you kind of highlight a bit about the um, the safety concerns are out there? And so what are we doing? What 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 are we contemplating to try and mitigate uh, those possible things. And, and perhaps you need to phone a friend in, in, in the energy industry to kind of talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with that storage. Um, if you, you know, I'll just stop right there and let you answer. Sure. And so sections three through eight of the bill uh, deal with all of the aspects of storage. And uh, currently in statute, there is a definition for, uh, for energy storage. And it's um, it's the storage of energy. It's not necessarily the storage of electricity, and it's uh, um, and it's it's 
neutral it's it's agnostic to the technology and so we want to without you know knowing what the future holds i mean i look back 10 years as somebody who's been in this industry for 20 oh, 22 years 21 years now there is no way i could even possibly imagine how far we would have come technologically in the last 10 years and that zero way i'm going to be able to predict what we'll be able to do in the next 10 the next 10 years on the technology. So we stay agnostic in this bill and in current statute to what type of energy storage, because there's, there's all types. Um, right now, the most common is um, lithium, um, ty any type of lithium battery, and that stores energy um, in a, uh, a chemical electrical way. And that's what you know is in your is in this computer. It's it's what's in your 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 phone in your pocket. It's it's what's in electric vehicles. But it's also very prevalent in large scale utility energy storage. But there are a lot of other technologies as well. And whenever you're storing in a large amount of energy, that safety has to be paramount. And um, and we've heard that through the, a few different bills in this legislative session. And you want qualified um, uh, people and qualified companies um, doing that work. And uh, you want to make sure training is available to them. And so I, I feel comfortable with, uh, with proper training um, and the uh, properly qualified individuals and qualified companies that we can safely do this work. Um, but this, this particular bill is, is like I said, uh, does not speak to the technology. It just speaks to storage as it currently exists in statute. Okay, so apparently I need to go to others as well and find out where we are as far as it might be concerned would be safety as you're as you're trying to use it more uh, and you're trying to store more energy in batteries. Um, I just want to know more about that and I, I could take that offline and, and find out from those who, who do it. Uh, that, that's fine and I'll turn it back over to the chair and you can make you can comment on that if you want, um, but it's not really a question. I'll just do it offline. Uh, chair. Thank you, Senator Hammond. Uh, do committee members have any additional questions? Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, I agree. I mean, this is, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, this was a lot to digest, but um, uh, let me ask just one kind of general question, then I've got uh, three or four uh, specific questions. Uh, you mentioned national security and uh, um, uh, how uh, uh, our current transmission system uh, it is risky. Um, I remember sitting through the uh, um, uh, briefings uh, with the Admiral on this with you. So we've been, uh, 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 you know, we're aware of that. Uh, I'm assuming that these lines that we're looking at building are merely extensions of the existing system. Um, or are we building in, you know, how is this being built so that we are addressing those security issues? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator uh, um, Pickard. So if you, using that slide as an example, and then I'll go to the 500 kV bulk um, system slide. Uh, right now, there is one line that connects uh, northern Nevada to southern Nevada. One line. And, and then out of northern Nevada, out of the, you know, I think it's Robinson Summit uh, substation outside of Ely, um, you have some connectivity at lower voltages to other parts of the state. But what this, this plan would do is it creates the redundancy of having that triangle. So if you lose one line, you have two other segments that can feed that same load. If you lose two lines, then that load is isolated. But this increases the redundancy uh, tremendously by just doing that. And, and that is really the redundancy in the lines is what creates the resiliency in the system. And so... Um, and if, if you look at that triangle, do you know what's right in the middle of that triangle? One of the, the, the biggest national security resources in, in the entire world. And so increasing redundancy in, in, this, in this area would be great. Sure, and, and uh, you know, redundancy is one way to secure it, of course. Um, uh, one of the things that the Admiral discussed was the fact that since most of our transmission is open, exposed, and uh, um, uh, visible from, you know, anywhere, um, that itself presents a, uh, a problem. Anyway, uh, but redundancy is the answer, and, and I realize uh, there's no silver bullet. Uh, let me get into some of the details here. Uh, I'm looking first at Section 10. We've deleted the uh, uh, provisions, essentially all the provisions 
of the uh, electric vehicle infrastructure demonstration program. Um, I'm wondering why that is. Is that because it's obsolete? Um, if so, why didn't we delete the program instead? Uh, the language simply says that the commission shall adopt the regs and then it deletes all the guidance. Can you uh, explain that? Bob Johnston, policy advisor for the record. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Senator Pickard. Current in the 2017 session as part of SB 145, the legislature uh, authorized NB Energy to uh, create a demonstration program known as Electric Vehicle Infrastructure uh, Demonstration Program. And they've, that program is continuing on as we speak. There's a, there's a case pending right now before the Public Utilities Commission. Limited amount of funding. Uh, it's subject to the overall 290 million, I believe, cap under new renewable programs under Chapter uh, 701B, I believe it is. And so uh, the the Section 9 and 10 really have to do with the phase out of the of the electric vehicle infrastructure de demonstration program as transportation electrification planning becomes part of the resource planning at the utility. So it's, it's not, uh, and, and if you look at the effective dates for section nine and 10, they're timed so that that program will phase out as the other one ramps up. Right, and I appreciate that. I, I, that's, that was my assumption uh, because we're well past the point of that. I was here when we established that. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, it just, the disconnect seemed to be we're maintaining the requirement for the commission to adopt the regulations, but then we're, we're only eliminating the guidance, and that didn't make sense to me. But uh, uh, if, that's pro if that's kept merely to uh, manage the phase out, um, that makes sense, I, but I was just guessing. Um, if, is that why we're keeping that in place? Uh, Bob Johnson. For the record, yeah, yes, you're correct, Senator Pickard. The thought is, is that first it removes the, le the legal obligation for NB Energy to include uh, uh, that demonstration program in its annual plans filing. And then second, it eliminates the whole, uh, that whole provision of NRS 701B after the program, after all the funding under that program has, has expired. All right, thank you for that. Uh, next, I have a question on section 21. Um, let's see, it looks like it's the, it's sub two, no, I'm sorry, sub three. Um, uh, we've got, uh, it, we're, we're uh, distributing the, the, uh, um, not cost, but the uh, infrastructure um, uh, provisions. Uh, we've got a 70-30 split. 70% uh, of the costs of uh, high, uh, high voltage transmission infrastructure projects uh, are going to the urban areas, 30% uh, uh, to the um, uh, uh, less populated, um, or let's see, do I have that backwards? Um, uh, explain the 70-30 split. Basically what I wanted to get at is, is this an arbitrary uh, division? Um, I was thinking 70% went to uh, the urban areas, 30% went to the rural areas. Maybe I've got that backwards. But I'm wondering, anytime I see round numbers, it looks like an arbitrary uh, designation, but I'm wondering what went behind that. Uh, Senator Pickard, that it's 70% it's south and 30 percent north and it's so some and it's, it's a mix of urban and, and and rural and both the southern and the northern territory uh the way that 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 um sierra pacific power company and nevada power company under nv energy um are viewed in in the statutes are separately and and some uh some things are allocated separately some things are allocated across the same where 70 percent of the load is in the south and 30 percent of the load is in the north and therefore a bulk transmission system that serves well it serves the entire state to the benefit of all nevadans um 
it, it really is, is distributing energy. And so uh, an allocation based upon energy usage is, has been used in the past for these types of investments. Sure, and, and one of the things that uh, we've heard is that the uh, rural areas generally uh, don't get enough money to do what we can do down south kind of thing, and it, it feeds this, this sense of north-south divide. Um, uh, and and what, I, uh, what I was getting at was, uh, you know, why are we picking these numbers? It sounds like it's a load issue, and if 70% of the load is, is down south, uh, then that may be, a, a, you know, geographical um, uh, coincidence, uh, but I was just trying to get into the the uh, why are we picking those numbers? So it's just based on load. It, it is based on load, and load is relatively tied to population. Although temperature and both cold and hot affect those as well. Temperature has a great deal to do with load, um, but it, it's it's a load calculation. And as as a load infrastructure, uh, the cost cal. Out uh, allocation is based on the load allocation. All right, and that makes sense. And, and I would think that as we're trying to get to a strictly electric-based society, um, uh, the load in the winter time in the south is going to go up substantially. Um, all right, my next question is on section 31. I'm on page 21. Um, we're creating the Regional Transmission Coordination Task Force. Um, uh, we've got a number of representatives being appointed by different groups. I noticed down in uh, uh, 14 and 15, the majority gets to put a couple of people on, but the minority do not. Um, uh, is there a reason why we're concentrating legislative input uh, in the majority and not having any minority representation? I mean, that's obviously not intentional, but um, I, it, you know, we try to limit it some sort of representation on the task force uh, to, to be as broad as possible. I've already gotten some criticism from probably some people sitting behind me that it's too big. And, um, and, and so uh, we, you try to get as much representation, as broad as a representation as possible without loading up too many from any one sector. So, you know, two legislators is some might say too, too many, but um, <laughs> uh, so just trying to limit it to two legislators, the kind of most efficient way to do that, I and mean, we even see this in the Ledge Commission and things like that, is just have the majority leader and the speaker make the appointment. By no means am, am I ad adverse to, to having a minority uh, party pick as well, and and it just makes the, the, the task force that much larger. But... Um, in, in, in a situation like this, it, I, I don't see that it's it's partisan. You would want to pick the, the legislator, both from the assembly and the senate, that's going to really do the work and 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 have an interest, and and um, maybe even bring some expertise. All right, I appreciate that. I just, you know, particularly since uh, majorities change, policies change, um, uh, it, it, and I think of this in the the crucible of debate. Um, uh, even Harry Reid recently said we need a, a strong two-party system because it's in that crucible that we actually vet things. Um, uh, and this uh, avoids that. I just wonder maybe we could have a, uh, um, you know, the, uh, um, the core group, the, the minority leaders in both houses, um, select two people, one from each party. Um, I, I don't really care how we do it. I'm just looking at, you know, we, we have seen this in this committee uh, a couple of times now, and I just I struggle with, and it's not because I'm in the minority. It's because we need the breadth of experience and approach to get uh, the the kind of perspective that we need. And and I, as someone who sits on this committee with with my my colleagues here that are, are I'm talking to today, I've heard that argument made, and I I don't disagree. And so um, it's just you know trying to keep it to a manageable number. Um, I've already gotten some some feedback of, of all kinds of sectors that should be on on this task force. And then the task force, at the end of the day, makes a recommendation to the Public Utilities Commission and makes a recommendation to us, the legislature, that we may or may not choose to do anything with. And so uh, just trying to keep it as efficient as possible. But I am not against having a minority party, uh, um, or you know, in each house make recommendations by any means. All right. Uh, well, and, and I agree, 16 people on a committee make it very difficult to make a decision. Um, um, but that would be my recommendation. Uh, my last question, Madam Chair, 
uh, it has to do with uh, section 44 I'm on page 37 um, and we're providing uh, uh, incentives to um, uh, low-income households residents customers I'll get it out and public schools um, why not all education uh, public private uh, k-12 uh, um, uh, uh, you know uh, secondary education uh, why don't we broaden this instead of just the, the uh, and when I read public schools I'm reading that as k-12 schools why not uh, broaden that to all of the educational facilities that uh, we have in the state well, I mean, I, I, ultimately, I would love to see it everywhere. And this is, a, uh, for lack of a, a better uh, term, a pilot program on the initial investment. And, um, and the state, the taxpayers of the state of Nevada are responsible for the education of, or, or excuse me, the transportation in public schools. They aren't responsible for the, the cost of transportation outside of that public school sector. So if we can save some tax dollars at the same time that we're uh, achieving our policy goals, that would be the best. So that's why we kind of concentrated on that. Sure. In the and broader plan, though, there is absolutely nothing that, that precludes every type of, of use and every type of education. Sure, and I appreciate that. And I, I guess I, when I was reading this, I didn't view this strictly as a taxpayer savings. This was more of a consumer savings uh, pilot. And uh, so I was just curious to know what the thinking was, why we're limiting it to the public K-12 schools um, uh, instead of the privates and NSHE and, and the rest of the facilities that uh, might actually benefit from it. But and, I understand. And there's nothing even within this program to keep it out of those organizations. We just want to make sure that we're, we're directing uh, very specifically and intentionally towards the public schools um, because they have a very centralized and and very uh, um, you know sophisticated transportation network where you could really get a lot of bang for your buck now none of this works none of this works to drive down rates for ratepayers or to reduce carbon unless it gets utilized and very well utilized so we don't want to just put it someplace for for show and it not get used we we want to put these in places where they get the absolute highest use and that gives us the best bang for our buck both from a carbon uh a reduction pollution and ratepayer standpoint all right thank you for that and thank you madam chair senator spearman Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Brooks, this is great. It's, it's rather comprehensive and took me a minute to get through it, but I think it's, real, uh, I think it's good. I just have a, a, a couple of questions and they relate to um, most of the references to electric, um, but you know, let me read you just a couple of things and I'll make sure that the committee manager gets these links. Um, this is from the Center for Naval Analysis. You, you know, I'm, I'm big on national security and what all that means. Um, it says, it's, um, it's the article is uh, Advanced Energy and National Security. We anticipate the growing demand for electricity will be met in increasingly with distributed advanced energy systems. Wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, hydrogen, and other energy sources. Because many of these systems can be distributed, they can meet the energy needs of a population. So they're looking at, um, the DOD is looking at, at, at hydrogen. They're also, uh, to include uh, Nellis, they're also looking at hydrogen as an alter alternative fuel cell in, um, at Hickam Air Force Base, uh, Pearl Harbor Hickam Air Force Base. They've been experimenting with this since 2006 and now have several other buses that transport the pilots from, you know, onto the tarmac and off uh, with, with hydrogen. There are, there are four ways that they're saying that, <clears throat> excuse me, the military can use hydrogen. Please don't hear this as downing electric. I'm not doing that. I'm just trying to make sure that we're, we're, we're broad in what our thinking is. Um, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, um, they're using that. Um, undersea vehicles, they're using it there. Um, using it in light duty trucks and also some heavy duty trucks with the Army. Um, and I think the, the one that intrigued me the most was the wearable power systems that they're developing for people when you go into combat. The, the lithium battery is a little bit high, a little bit, a little bit um, heavy. And so what they're looking at is they're looking at experimenting with, with hydrogen as to how that would do. So I guess my, my question would be, is there any room for, 
for the exploration of other um, sources of, of energy. And I'm, I'm just thinking about that from a standpoint of making sure that we're making sure that we're we're um, exploiting all of our resources, um, geothermal, hydrogen fuel cells, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, so that that's my question. Uh, absolutely, Senator Spearman, and, and there is room for it. You even have a bill that does it. So, and I plan on voting for that as well. And, um, and, and so we're, this, is, this is about the here and the now. Um, we have uh, electric vehicles are coming. Um, I can go out and buy hundreds. If, if you look at all the manufacturers and variants, there's hundreds of ve electric vehicles available right now. I can go in my garage and I can plug it in. I cannot buy a hydrogen vehicle and there isn't a hydrogen station in the, in the state of Nevada. So we're trying to deal with the here and the now and wow, we encourage the, 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 the next, the future, the, the, what's going to happen with, you know, specifically around uh, uh, clean, clean uh, gas and, and hydrogen's role in clean gas. But um, this, this is about what's happening, moving electricity, and, 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 and this is about storage. Hydrogen is an energy storage. Um, uh, is, is, it takes energy to make the hydrogen. Hydrogen stores the energy, and then you can turn that energy, uh, hydrogen into some sort of power, whether it be electricity or, or some sort of motion. And so um, this uh, hydrogen, I'm sure, will have a piece, uh, will, will, will fit into this in the future. Hydrogen is not a thing that really currently exists in the state of Nevada right now. And so what we're trying to do is take full advantage of what's here, what's now, and what can put people to work immediately, and what can show the benefits to our community immediately, all while it integrates future developments and things such as hydrogen. And so um, I think that they, they work together. While it may not address it, this is addressing a very specific thing, and that's, that's the electrification of transportation and transmission. Um, I, th I see hydrogen doesn't compete with this. It, it complements it. Senator Hammond? Well, I know, you, Chair, that you would like to ask questions first, so I'll, I'll wait till you're... Oh, no, please. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of the electric uh, uh, avenue, uh, le I wanted to go back to that. It, it, you know, I've read articles talking about, uh, you know, perhaps uh, we're going to see 8% uh, electric, uh, electric uh, vehicles on the highway by 2030, maybe more than that. Uh, there's, they're all over the place. Um, what you're suggesting in this bill is a significant investment and in, uh, uh, in making sure that these vehicles, no matter where they're at, uh, coming from California, whether on the court of the uh, the corridor in uh, Las Vegas, that they have charging stations. That's a that's a pretty significant investment, but I don't know if it's enough. What what can you tell me the state of privatization or private investment in uh, in, in these charging stations? Um, I'd really like to know kind of where we're at with that intersection because it's it, you know government sometimes they, they kind of push for certain things that to happen or we help to spur innovation we help to spur some investment uh, and I think that's what you're trying to do with the bill but at some point the private uh, uh, businesses have to get involved as well so is there is there what kind of talk are we are we seeing about that I, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's 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 about leveraging right it's about leveraging public funds ratepayer funds and 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 otherwise private funds and um and what this bill is 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 directing is the investment in and in charging infrastructure electrical infrastructure and so you know and i've i've worked on the development of a couple of you know charging infrastructure projects in my career and the charger and the, the charging piece of it is the absolute lowest cost piece of it it's the electrical infrastructure to get it there and and to, to to provide the electricity to the charging uh the charging station and so um if you have uh an investment and this is just you're right it is not enough you say is this enough by no means it is a drop in the bucket of what's going to be necessary but it's it lays some groundwork and starts some investment that we can see private investment piggyback off of so if you make a, a, an investment in and in, like i'll use the one i did for an example um uh tesla wanted to build a charging station in Beatty. valley electric wanted to build a charging station in Beatty. they got together and split the cost on the electrical infrastructure to get to that 
it by itself, either one of them would have had to pay the entire cost and it's the same cost. And so if you can build that infrastructure and, and direct that infrastructure here, you could see all kinds of uh, different investment. That's why we made it very clear in here third party ownership it, it can be included, uh, uh, rebates can be included, so that we are using a $100 million investment uh, to hopefully leverage that into several hundred million dollars of investment in, in business models we haven't yet even imagined. And so uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and that's why we made sure that we, we, li we, we didn't limit the ownership or, or the placement of any of these charging uh, uh, stations um, in the bill, because we want to be able to leverage $100 million into much more money than that, hopefully. Thank you, Senator Brooks. Uh, and, I, and you gave me one example. Um, is there, uh, and I know that uh, I may have spoken with uh, uh, Mr. Bobzian about this as well in the past, and I think he may have mentioned something like that. I don't know if he wanted to get on the, the record uh, or not. And I know uh, Mr. Potts has mentioned a lot of uh, numbers. He's, he's overwhelmed me with numbers, actually, in this presentation. I have to go back and uh, re-listen to what he gave me and or all of us here. But uh, if any one of those want to talk about that, because I, I think you gave us one example, and I, I'm glad that we're seeing that investment, or at least the cooperation between public and private. Uh, and it is about leveraging the money. But if they, if they want to chime in, that'd be great as well. Director Bobsey, and if you just want to, you know, you could talk briefly about some of the opportunities that exist with the uh, electric highway. Avenue. Yeah. But, yeah, thank you, Senator uh, David Bobsey, for the record, and, and um, Senator Hammond, you're, you're, you're correct, and this is a good line of inquiry, and I, and I definitely think that um, Senator Brooks' example of the leverage funding uh, opportunity or uh, situation that happened at Baby was a perfect example. Um, it, it's true. There's a lot of this is having to uh, run the wire, make sure the power is there, so that the ultimate, um, you know, charging piece at the very end uh, is 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 able to be deployed. Um, but you know, certainly, you're you're familiar with. I, I know you prefer the term Electric Avenue, the Nevada Electric Highway. Uh, we have that in partnership um, with both uh, MV Energy uh, as well as uh, a number of the rural electric co-ops across the state. And so we've had different models for um, the different territories. And then, of course, we have host sites, and so we have, um, uh, you know, private companies, uh, businesses that uh, see the advantage of hosting um, the uh, the infrastructure as another way to sort of uh, expand their their market. Um, people like to plug in; they have to spend a little bit of time there. They can come in, they can shop, uh, and so I think with um, what's contemplated in this plan really is uh, a way to kind of level up the investment. And my hope is that it will do nothing but encourage even greater um, private uh, investment and, and entrepreneurship and, and, and activity uh, in this space to, to really uh, help build out uh, the EV charging uh, infrastructure that we, 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 we do need uh, heading into the future. Cool. Thank you, Thank you uh, Michael Brown, if I could also add. Uh, Michael Brown, Governor's Office of Economic Development. Starting in the fall of last year, we also started to see just a series of announcements by the major manufacturers of automobiles, Toyota, BMW, uh, Volkswagen, across the board of a real serious commitment to electronic, uh, to electric vehicles. And I, th I think if you envision uh, Tesla, you know, as, as the one kind of opening the market up, and now you're seeing all the other car companies uh, come into it, I think there will come a point uh, mid-decade where, where suddenly uh, you're, you're going to reach a tipping point with respect to electric vehicles, given the size of investment. And I, I'd be glad to furnish for the record a couple industry articles on that. And uh, with respect to the earlier question, the Wall Street Journal story I referenced in my statement uh, talked about the industrial storage uh, batteries that allow for industrial storage of uh, renewable energy. And I'll, I'll submit all of that for the record and send it to uh, the members. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Director Bobsey and Mr. Um, Brown. Um, Speaking of battery storage, I guess the, the one question that keeps coming to mind is, you know, I was talking about the safety of it. I'd really like to get a, sort of an, an idea of where we're at with the safety of the battery storage. But in, in order, let's say a, a, a facility goes down, a, 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 something goes down, uh, somebody, you know, is no, not able to deliver the energy that we need, it goes down. Are, do we have the capabilities at this present moment for, for batteries to be able to replace uh, a, uh, 
a facility that goes down, for example, and they're not, not able to deliver the, the energy that we need at, at, at certain times. It, it, is, that, is that there now? Are we there with battery storage? Um, Michael Brown, for the record, and I'm not a subject matter expert on that, so I will find one for you. I, I think you have some help here. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Senator Hammond. Bob Johnston, policy advisor for the record. This is, is happening very quickly, and, but I can say right now uh, what we've seen in the last three years is, is NV Energy has come to the Public Utilities Commission and requested, uh, requested approval of what are becoming increasingly commonly called hybrid projects, uh, utility-scale renewable solar projects coupled with uh, battery storage. And so as those projects come online over the next three years, if they stay on, on schedule, by 2024, uh, NV Energy will have control in its system of 1,028 megawatts of essentially four-hour battery storage. And, so, and really, the economic driver for uh, signing those agreements and going forward with those projects was really to shift uh, solar production for midday, in, in effect, store solar production in the you know, mid-morning, midday, when demand is not as high, and have, it, have that energy stored so that you have that, that uh, say you had a 100 megawatt solar facility, it could produce 100 megawatts, you could get 100 megawatts of capacity out of that unit in the peak hours from four to nine in the evening. But it does provide storage to the extent it's not our, it, it's fully charged, it does provide a tremendous flexibility to the system operator if you have storage. Uh, but the, the rationale for going forward with this project was really to meet summer peak loads, if oh, that helps. It, that does help. And it, Mr. Johnson, if, if for, example, for example, if one of those uh, uh, solar plants went down and went offline for no, a long time, extended period, maybe more than was anticipated. How much uh, could we uh, anticipate the batteries then taking the place of the, the down uh, um, solar plant? Uh, Four hours, six hours, eight yeah. hours? Yes, Bob Johnson for the record. No, the battery, battery energy storage systems are really uh, short-term storage. They're to really uh, save renewable energy to match your system load so you can move it around within a 24-hour time period maybe, but no, you're only talking at, at maximum discharge, you're talking four hours, of most of it that, that's in the pipeline right now. And uh, at least the economics are such right now that, that uh, not many people are envisioning battery storage being a solution for storing, uh, storing energy for days or months or you know, for long-term storage. That really gets to, uh, uh, what Senator Spearman was referring to, where you're talking about uh, what's been termed green hydrogen, where you're using renewable energy, solar or wind, to make hydrogen by electrolysis, and then hydrogen can be stored for, for a long period of time, just like natural gas or oil. So, so if I may add to that, the technology exists, the, the, it's capable of doing all those things, it's just not cost effective. And that's not, so that's not how we're utilizing it at this point in time. And so um, it's really just to shift the load. So just a few hours usually. But like, it exists, it just depends on, you know, the application. For instance, I have 25 kilowatt hours in my garage in a, in a better energy storage system that will run my house if there were to be a blackout and you know that doesn't happen in my neighborhood but if that were to happen i could run my house with the solar indefinitely and so it it exists i paid dearly for it and so what what it really is just about the economics and then the last thing and, and then i'll turn it back over I, I don't think i'll have any more after this um i just wanted to make this statement uh, you know go along with uh what senator pickard said in, in, in section 31 when you're creating that uh, that task force uh, and i've said this before and other things and, and it's not just about the i don't think it's limited to just the uh, debate or the you know exchange of ideas sometimes uh, for both parties it's kind of nice to have somebody there who can report back to the larger body the the caucus if you will um, what's going on 
on. This is, as uh, uh, Director Brown said, a very bold uh, plan. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's very large. We're, we're changing sort of the direction of our energy policy here in the state of Nevada or, or adding to and in a major way, in, a, in addition, in a major way. And it would be kind of nice to make sure that we uh, are collaborating um, with you know, with the, the majority party um, or vice versa, wherever it goes in the future, but uh, making sure that there's uh, there's you know somebody there who's who's can report back. So I, I also I, I like the idea of adding somebody, despite the fact that it's already large right now, but trying to find some way to, to add something there just as a, somebody who can be there. I, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, as somebody who's worked with you on interim committees and, and partisan politics doesn't really factor into a lot of that or who's worked with Senator Pickard on back in the assembly even on some of this language as we put it together. Um, I think that, that it's more about expertise and participation than it has anything to do with politics or party. So I agree 100% and, and that's an addition that I think we would like to make. Okay. Um, I have a question about um, transmission only customers and how uh, this project might affect them given that they may not see any benefits on downward rates because they don't, you know, pay for electricity rates. Could you just talk a little bit about what impact we might see on the existing transmission only customers? Oh, absolutely. And thank you for that question. And, and, and Mr. Johnson here will correct me if I'm wrong, when I'm wrong. Um, and uh, transmission only customers do pay rates and they, they pay transmission rates and transmission customer only customers will pay portions of the investment and transmission customer only customers will get the benefit of the investment transmission customers only by that very name <laughs> access the transmission system and and to make the transmission system um, uh, more robust and have more access to more markets those transmission only customers will have that same exact access to other markets as a result of the transmission we even have some language in here that says that uh, um, and I'll, I'll try to locate it but it, it's it, it directs that the uh, access will be made to transmission only customers so that they can get the benefits of the transmission investment that they are going to help pay for and for that they should get the benefit i might even argue that their benefit would be even um, greater than the average rate payer because of the fact that they will be able to access directly uh, uh, renewable energy projects and and other markets possibly and so in section uh on page 29 and section i'm trying to now, this is a big bill, but it's on, on page 29, and that is, let me go back to which section that is. I think it is section 41, but um, 39, thank you. And it does provide guidance that, um, that access should be made to, um, although that is covered under their, um, their transmission only tariff that is, uh, in place in the state right now. We just wanted to make it crystal clear uh, when, when, when access was, was petitioned for that they had access to those, that transmission line. And there's, lo there's customers right now in this state that are buying renewable energy in one part of our state and are located in another part of our state and would do even more if there was less uh, constraints on the transmission system. And so by creating this, that very customer that I'm mentioning that is a transmission only customer will have more access to renewable energy at a lower price. Okay. Um, my next question has to do with the risk of the investment. And so um, it seems to me the way this is set up right now, if benefits don't materialize, which I think is a very small, small chance, um, rate payers, it seems, would be taking the entire burden of this being a great thing. Is, is there anything that protects for that, I guess, worst case scenario, right? I mean, I, I, at times you mentioned um, like uh, Tesla and um, some county in the north wanting to do charging stations, they came together, right? But that's a 50-50 kind of split. Uh, what is the, and, and maybe this is a question for Mr. Cannon since he's here, but what is the, what is the utility willing to put forward to kind of assure that ratepayers won't end up holding 
the bag if, if things don't work out. And, and if I understand your question by things don't work out, we don't use electricity or that we don't get the economic benefits beyond the cost of electricity that we're, we're, we're anticipating? It's the latter. So uh, we build all these infrastru uh, infrastructure for charging stations and um, uh, we don't actually get enough EVs to increase the demand. Or um, we uh, build out the transmission and it doesn't actually lead to the, the benefits that we are anticipating, right? And therefore the prices don't actually end up going down, although they should. I follow your logic. I don't disagree. I just, I think part of the reason why this is so difficult through the existing process is because some of the benefits are a bit likely but unknown, right? And so I, I, I want to know that there is something that the utility is willing to say to the ratepayers, this is worth you taking the entire burden as opposed to us sharing it or as us as shareholders because we're so convinced the investment is work, worth it making it on our own. Well, I, I think that um, if, if he's willing, I would turn that over to Mr. Cannon to, to I do not want to speak for what the utility is willing to do, but let me, let me step aside. Uh, Chair Harris, Doug Cannon, for the record. Uh, the way I'd answer that question, and I, and I do appreciate the question, is th there's a couple of components to, to that answer. First, the utility, this is a, an, a great example of that private-public par, uh, private partnership. There's a need that exists in Nevada today. The transmission system in northern Nevada is fully constrained. There are no additional imports that can come into northern Nevada. And unless we build infrastructure like this, our ability to support economic development down the road, a customer, a transmission only customer's ability to access the market is all limited. So the need for this infrastructure exists today. In addition, the reliability concerns that Senator Pickard raised earlier, you can see that Northern and Southern Nevada, if we put the map, so can I ask you, Bob, to put that map back up? You can see Northern and Southern Nevada right now we jointly dispatch generation through one single line. If we lose that line, Northern Nevada has to meet its energy needs all by itself with a constrained system. In addition, we can't use the low cost energy to serve Southern Nevada at opportune times. So we can't economically dispatch our system anymore. So there's a need, a, reliabil a, a true reliability need that exists today. So these economic benefits that we're talking about are in addition to the true reliability needs that we have to address as a state. Now, what's happening here is NV Energy is coming forward with private money and saying we're prepared today to fund $2.5 billion into the state of Nevada. Our, our, shareholders, our, our shareholders, we don't get recovery on that money until that asset actually goes into service. And then when that asset goes into service, the Public Utilities Commission, through a contested proceeding where parties get to intervene, every party gets to question every cost we put into that project, the Public Utilities Commission will then set how much of that investment we actually get to recover and will actually set the rate at which we get to earn on that asset. And so it will be, we're going to bring $2.5 billion to the table today. We're going to put thousands of people to work today. And Nevadans won't be asked to pay for this investment until at least five or six years down the road when we enter into and, and receive all the benefits of that immediate economic investment today. And so I guess in, in my perspective that this is a public-private partnership and we are coming to the table it's not a risk-free proposition. We don't know ultimately what the Public Utilities Commission will approve. We're gonna manage the project prudently. We're gonna be reasonable in our expenditures, but ultimately a lot of other parties will intervene in that proceeding. There'll be a lot of arguments over what costs were reasonable and prudent, and we may not come out of that proceeding with 100% cost recovery. And we'd model one return rate, you know, our return on investment in that proceeding but the commission may choose a different return on investment. And we go into this proceeding not knowing any of those numbers ahead of time. 
we go in simply trusting that there's a balanced regulatory process in place and that a balanced outcome will be delivered at the end of that process. But we do it in order to make sure that Nevadans can get to work today. And, and that's our goal. And I appreciate that, Mr. Cannon. Thank you so much. I don't intend to put you under the hot seat uh, hey, by uh, the means. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, some of them it, seems, it seems to me what you just described is the existing process not the new process by which once you submit an application, as long as it's procedurally, as long as it's not procedurally deficient, that application is going to be approved. And, and inevitably then those costs are likely going to be passed on to ratepayers as, as it should in, in many circumstances. Um, but without that same contested case that we have existing today, Am, am I misunderstanding that part of, of the bill? Uh, Doug Cannon, uh, Chair Harris, to answer your questions. Um, the legislation, and I'll, I'll certainly let um, Senator Brooks and, and Mr. Johnson answer the question as well, but um, from our perspective, the legislation does require us to submit a plan. That plan is a contested proceeding. Other parties have the opportunity to intervene to provide feedback and there are certain findings in that legislation, in this legislation that the commission would have to make in order to then tell a, or approve the plan that, that we submit. And so I, w while that plan is more prescriptive as described by Senator Brooks already, it is not a foregone conclusion. But that's one piece of the legislation. What this legislation doesn't change and doesn't put any guarantee for us is the recovery on that investment. That's a separate proceeding that's a separate process where we're gonna move forward, making that significant investment in the state of Nevada, putting Nevadans to work, trusting that there's a balanced process like I talked about. And you're right, we'll submit those in a general rate case down the road. That general rate case will be submitted and there'll be a ton of debate over whether we proceeded reasonably or not. And the, commission, the Public Utilities Commission will there ultimately make a decision. And this legislation doesn't change that. There is no guarantee in this legislation that we will recover the dollars of this investment. There's none. We have to pursue, proceed reasonably, and then we'll trust in the process on the back end that we have the opportunity to recover our investment and earn a reasonable return. It's kind of the, the regulatory compact that exists between the utility as a private entity and, and, and the state. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any additional questions before we go to testimony? Okay, seeing none, Senator Brooks, if it's okay with you, we'll move on to testimony. Uh, just a heads up, we are going to, unfortunately, everyone have to limit testimony uh, for the first time here in, in growth and infrastructure. Um, my plan is to limit it to 20 minutes in every position. Um, I will do 10 minutes in person and 10 minutes on the phone. Um, whatever we don't use in person, I will give to folks on the phone. So if there's only one minute of opposition here, I will allow nine, uh, I guess 19 minutes of opposition on the phone, but 20 minutes total and I'll start with an even split. Uh, and I will also have to ask uh, folks to keep their comments to two minutes uh, so we can get as many voices heard as possible. All right, with that, uh, we will open up testimony in support of Senate Bill 448 here in person. And if we could just do one person at a time, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Go ahead and start when you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Harris. Danny Thompson for the record representing IBW uh, 396. You know, about uh, 21 years ago, I was promoting thin film photovoltaic technology and I met, met a young electrician named Chris Brooks and he was promoting photovoltaic. And so I think it's fitting today that he's here with this bill because he's been doing this his whole life. And uh, you know, we just want to testify in support of this bill. This bill will create thousands of jobs and not lousy jobs. I'm talking about jobs, good paying jobs with benefits, health care and retirement. And so it's a great economic uh, opportunity for the state of Nevada, both from all the benefits we will receive from building out the infrastructure, but job creation as well. Thank you.
Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman and the committee. My name is Ernie Adler and I represent IBW 1245. Um, we also believe this is a great bill in terms of job creation. For instance, the average wage on the building the transmission in this case is going to be $106,000 a year, which is, which is an amazing wage in terms of this region. So we would strongly support that. And then in addition, there's $49.3 million in sales tax generated by this pro the transmission project, which is going to go back to the counties and the state government. So this is going to be an economic boon for Nevada, and we strongly support it from that perspective. Thank you. Good evening, Chair and Committee Members. Michael Hillerby with Kemper Kroll on behalf of Google here today in support of SB 448, in particular the provisions surrounding a regional transmission organization. And we want to thank Senator Brooks for bringing the bill forward. Google is proud to call Nevada home with a total committed investment of $1.8 billion across two data center campuses, the first of which in Henderson reached full operations in February. Governor Sisolak, State of the State, sent a clear message about Nevada's commitment, and we thank him for his leadership and work with the legislature on this issue. Nevada's commitment to clean energy future is important to Google and will help the company meet its goal of 24-7 carbon-free energy by 2030. That will begin with our data centers here in Nevada and elsewhere. Nevada's participation in a regional transmission organization is a critical tool for achieving the state's clean energy goals, and we are pleased to see support from Senator Brooks and the governor for this important issue. We look forward to working with you in the state of Nevada to help our state be at the forefront of the clean energy economy and bringing new technologies to the market. Thank you. Can you turn your mic on? No problem, oh. thank you. I was wondering, it sounded a little muffled. You sound much better. <laughs> thank you. Here, here, here on behalf of Consolidated Edison. Please you state your name one more time? Once again, Ed Garcia, for the record. Uh, here to support Senate Bill 448. Uh, specifically, the sections dealing with um, energy storage projects. Con Edison develops and owns and operates utility-scale renewable energy projects as one of the largest solar owners and operators in North America. I had some, uh, some more remarks, but in the interest of time, uh, some of the comments made by the director of the Governor's Office of Energy when he referred to those companies looking for opportunities here to build large-scale storage, uh, we are one of those companies. Um, one of the biggest barriers to development of these types of projects is uncertainty, and this bill goes a long way towards alleviating a lot of that uncertainty. And my client, Consolidated Edison, looks forward to developing uh, f more storage projects along with more renewable projects in the state of Nevada. Thank you. Madam Chair, committee, for the record, my name is Baird Fogel, F-O-G-E-L, and I have the privilege of serving as counsel to Haas Automation. I'm here on behalf of Haas today in support of Senate Bill 448, and specifically sections 45 to 47, the Economic Development Rate Rider, or EDRR. As some of you know, Haas is a machine tooling and manufacturing company. The plans to build a manufacturing facility in Nevada that will provide more than 2,000 high-paying, skilled labor jobs that are deemed essential and therefore pandemic-proof. The provision of sections 45 to 47, which extend the EDRR to 2024, is a key component in the company's consideration in making Southern Nevada a manufacturing hub. We look forward to working with local and state officials as we continue to develop plans, and we thank you for your consideration of this important legislation. Thank you all.
Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Susan Fisher with McDonald Carano, speaking on behalf of a couple of clients here today. The first one is AbleGrid Energy Solutions. AbleGrid supports SB 448, and in particular, we appreciate the provisions of sections three through eight relating to energy storage. AbleGrid develops uh, and builds low-cost energy storage assets that provide reliable and emissions-free capacity to manage physical and financial volatility of the energy markets. We appreciate all the bill sponsor's time that he spent with us and with the, the partners at IBEW. We had a lot of time with them. And while we'd like to see this expanded to standalone energy storage, we understand this is a big step. This is much bigger than a baby step. And we look forward to continuing to work with the sponsor over the interim on this important policy and as the industry gets developed further. In addition, I'm representing today Ovation Development Corporation, and you will hear later when you get to the phones uh, from Alan Mulaski, who is the founder and CEO of Ovation. Um, and this is speaking to the, um, the rooftop solar piece, which I, we call tenant solar. And this is not something that has been put together by Senator Brooks in a vacuum. We've been talking with him about this for over four years. We actually had legislation last session, but it wasn't quite gelled yet. And we're hoping that this session is the one for it to be gelled. This will help flatten out energy costs for both the landlords and for the tenants. It would be a big system going into one big meter rather than individually metered for the tenants. And we really look forward to working on this going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harris and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy Cabrera and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for the Nevada Conservation League here in support of SB 448. As home to some of the fastest warming cities in the United States, Nevada is already feeling the impacts of climate change. We've made strides to become a cleaner and greener state, but we are still not on track to meet our climate goals and there is still plenty of work to be done. SB 448 will allow our state to continue to invest in a clean energy economy make strides in achieving our carbon reduction goals, and put no more Nevadans to work in the fast-growing green energy economy. This bill also prioritizes historically underserved communities. Currently, NV Energy is required to spend at least 5% of its energy efficiency program on programs directed to low-income customers. SB 448 would double the investment to 10%, aligning our state with the national average. Targeted energy efficiency measures would lessen the strain for families paying high energy bills and prevent them from facing the difficult decision between paying bills and putting food on the table. SB 448 will lead to jobs and cost savings to power Nevadans economic recovery with a focus on underserved communities who've been hit the hardest by climate change and the economic downturn. At the same time, these policies will put us on a path to meet our goals of 100% clean energy and net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We urge the committee's support and thank you for your time tonight. Chairwoman Harris and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and excuse my voice, uh, Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We are in support of SB 448. This bill contains many good provisions, but I wanted to speak to just a few of the highlights that we are glad to see in this bill. SB 448 expands energy efficiency programs to reduce the cost of energy, particularly for low income families while reducing uh, pollution along with it. In Las Vegas and in Reno, two of the nation's fastest warming cities, conserving energy with greater efficiency is, in, is imperative to keep costs and energy usage manageable in our hot summers. SB 448 also invests in building electric vehicles, charging stations around the state. This will not only incentivize individuals, businesses, and local governments to, tra to transition to electric vehicles, but also create thousands of good paying jobs in the transportation sector. It would make Nevada among the nation's leaders for electri electrifying transportation and cutting harmful vehicle emissions. This investment includes 40% of this EV charging infrastructure in historically underserved communities, including communities of color. These communities face greater risk of asthma, which I am currently dealing with, and other respiratory diseases due to air pollution. 
as was confirmed in recent data from the American Lung Association's AIR report. We, we appreciate sen the Senator for hearing the voices of the communities who've spoken out about this issue for years and taking steps to address it. This bill will help Nevada reach the governor's emission reduction goals to fight climate change and create thousands of jobs here in the state. We thank Senator Brooks for bringing forward SB 448 and once again being a leader on climate action in Nevada. We urge your support. Okay, I hope that actually concludes everyone in person. If so, we did that perfectly. Um, we'll now go ahead and turn to uh, 10 minutes of testimony on the phone. BPS, could you pull the line, see if there's anyone who'd like to testify in uh, support of Senate Bill 448, and we will keep it on a strict two minute per, per speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Callers, if you would like to provide testimony in support of Senate Bill 448, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Will the caller with the last three digits of 710 please press star six to unmute yourself? All right, looks like that caller is having some technical difficulties, so we will go ahead and move on to the next one if that's okay. Go for it. Will the caller with the last three digits of 266 please state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, thank you. My name is Nate Bluin. That's B-L-O-U-I-N. Uh, and I work as the policy manager for the Interwest Energy Alliance. Interwest is the regional trade association representing large-scale solar, wind, and storage companies developing the renewable resources that Nevada will need uh, to meet the state's climate and energy policy goals. Interwest supports SB 448 and thanks the sponsor for bringing forward this landmark legislation that will strengthen Nevada's position as one of the nation's leaders in the new energy economy. Interwest supports two pillars of SB 448. First uh, is the direction given to Nevada utilities to join a regional transmission organization or RTO by 2030. Joining an RTO expands access to energy resources from ac across the region to complement Nevada's strong solar and geothermal capacity. An RTO will reduce customer costs by allowing utilities to rely on diverse and low-cost renewable energy resources and by coordinating transmission planning and dispatch across a large region while sharing the costs across a broader base. Second, SB 448 supports regional energy transmission by requiring a plan for construction of new high voltage transmission lines will facilitate joining an RTO. Uh, this section is crucial to building projects that are already in the planning phase and will bring new jobs to Nevada while opening up new areas to solar, wind, and geothermal development. This bill rightly identifies transmission as a critical piece of the state's energy and climate strategy. While we support other aspects of this bill, including the expansion of the renewable energy tax abatement to energy storage projects, the two pieces I focused on today are among the most important steps that Nevada can take to meeting the state's climate and energy goals. They position Nevada to be a national leader in renewable energy development and will bolster the state's economy with new jobs and revenues. Please support SB 448. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 439 also please state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Carolyn Turner, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N-T-U-R-N-E-R, -E Executive Director of the Nevada Rural Electric Association. NRE and its utility members are here today in support of Senate Bill 448. We'd like to thank Senator Brooks for bringing forward this legislation and for his leadership in the space. NRA represents the collective interests of 10 consumer-owned utilities throughout the state of Nevada, which are democratically governed and operated on a not-for-profit basis. 
Each utility is motivated first and foremost to provide safe, reliable, and affordable electric service to the communities it serves. Local governance has resulted in the deployment of innovative solutions by consumer and utilities, such as community solar programs, early adoption of low carbon energy resources, and the expansion of EV charging infrastructure in partnership with the Governor's Office of Energy. NRA members acquire and deliver electricity independently. However, the majority of our members receive transmission services from the investor and utility, and we appreciate Chair Harris uh, asking about some of those costs. NRA members, therefore, have a vested interest in ensuring that there is sufficient capacity in the state's transmission system to support the economic development goals and vitality of all Nevada communities, both rural and urban. As demand on the energy system has grown in our state, congestion has occurred within the confines of existing infrastructure. It's critical that future projects address these constraints and prioritize the needs of native load within our state borders. In addition to investment in physical infrastructure, the legislation before you today contemplates the formation of an organized energy market in the West over the next decade. NREA takes no position on any particular market construct at this time. However, we would like to offer a strong support for the establishment of the Regional Transmission Coordination Task Force as envisioned in Section 31 of the bill. NREA would like to thank uh, Senator Brooks for including a representative of the consumer-owned utility industry in the makeup of the task force in recognition of the unique perspective we offer. Our association looks forward to the opportunity to work collaboratively with other stakeholders to ensure that participation in an organized market is achieved with the best interests of all Nevadans in mind. Thank you, Chair Harris, for the opportunity to provide my remarks. Thank you. Uh, BPS, before we move on to the next caller, can we circle back with that first caller and see if they are available before we run out of time? Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Uh, will the caller with the last, yes, caller with the last three digits of 710, please state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and you begin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning or afternoon, Madam Chair and Committee. My name is Alan Malaski. I'm the CEO and founder of Ovation Development. Ovation has built and manages over 8,000 apartment homes. In addition to our market rate communities, we are one of Nevada's major providers of senior affordable housing. My family and I have been advocates of renewable energy since 1979, the year that I built three passive solar homes, some of the first in the country. And recently, my father, Erwin Molaski, was recognized by the U.S. GBC with a Lifetime Achievement Award for his many buildings that obtained LEED Gold designation. I am speaking today in support of SB 448, and specifically Section 36, which will allow owners of multifamily properties to install renewable energy systems, allowing residents to use clean, renewable energy produced on site. There are a few reasons I support the bill. First, we've all learned of the threat to our planet from global warming, and this bill will help reduce our carbon footprint by expanding the use of renewable energy. Second, renters, just like homeowners, want and should have the choice to power their homes with renewable energy. I would like to reiterate that the provisions of Section 36 apply to master metered properties only. So is there's simply a flat amount rolled into the rent as opposed to individually metered units where the tenants sign up with the local utilities and receive individual utility bills, which goes up and down with the season. I wish to thank Senator Brooks for including this provision in SB 448. And I was very impressed with the committee. Thank you for letting me participate. Thank you, Chair. Would you like me to move on to the next caller now? Yes, please. And we will take two more. All right. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 550 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin. Chair Paris, members of the committee, my name is Ann Silver, A-N-N-S-I-L-V-E-R, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce in support of Senate Bill 448. We believe through passage of this bill, Nevada will establish a foundation for meeting its climate goals, help businesses reduce their carbon footprint, and develop a sustainable, robust, and clean energy economy. In order to accommodate our increasing share of renewable energy, we must have an updated transmission network. 
Building out this network quickly and efficiently will provide a boost to statewide commerce. We also support the bill's proposal to kickstart the investment in infrastructure needed to support clean electric vehicles, buses, bikes, and other modes of transportation. By building out a network of charging stations, Nevada can help more businesses and consumers make a thoughtful transition to electric cars. Deliberate and strategic placement of this infrastructure could help businesses as they entertain, feed, and attract EV tourists who have time for their vehicles to recharge. Our chamber also supports elements of this bill that will align energy planning processes with our state climate, stri state climate strategy goal of reaching carbon-free resources. These are common sense measures that will enhance Nevada's reputation as a clean energy leader, protective and respectful of our natural resources, and supportive of good business practices. We urge your support for Senate Bill 448 and thank Senator Brooks for this piece of legislation. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 533 please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin now with two minutes. Uh, Chair Harris, Vice Chair Brooks, and members of the committee, my name is Dylan Sullivan, spelled S-U-L-L-I-B-A-N. I'm a senior scientist at the Natural Resources Defense Council, an environmental group with 25,000 members and activists uh, in, in the state of Nevada, here today to testify in support of Senate Bill 448. Uh, to combat the air pollution um, that makes communities more vulnerable to COVID-19 and, and meet the state's goals for reductions of emissions of greenhouse gases, Nevada needs to quickly transition its transportation sector to zero emission vehicles powered by renewable electricity. This is going to require an active partnership between the electric industry, labor, and independent firms to deploy charging infrastructure for all types of electric vehicles, light, medium, and heavy duty. SB 448 would jumpstart that effort and require that no less than 40% of these investments uh, be made in the historically underserved communities that have been hit hardest by, uh, by the pandemic and are hit hardest by air pollution in the state. Installing electrical equipment needed to charge those vehicles not only keeps workers on the job, it accelerates transportation electrification that benefits everyone. NJ Bradley and Associates estimates that widespread adoption of electric vehicles in Nevada could yield $14 billion in avoided consumer expenditures on gasoline and maintenance, $3 billion in environmental benefits, and $3.6 billion in reduced utility bills by 2050. Uh, this is because EVs can be charged when there's plenty of spare capacity on the grid, uh, which brings in new revenue in excess of uh, the cost to serve that load, putting downward pressure on utility rates to the benefits of all utility customers. Uh, the legislature should uh, take these uh, estimates into account because they comport with what's already been documented in the real world. According to Synapse Energy Economics, EV drivers in the two utility service territories in the U.S. with the most electric vehicles have already contributed over $806 million. Uh, and in that's two of, minutes, uh, Mr. Sullivan. That load. If you could just wrap up for us, please. Thank you. Okay. I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, let's bring it. Uh, let's bring it back to the room. Is there anyone in the room who would now like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 448? Good afternoon. Uh, Laura Grenier, for the record, on behalf of the Nevada Resort Association. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and committee members. I'd like to first thank Senator Brooks for his work on this bill and acknowledge his efforts to advance renewable energy development and job creation. The reason we're here in technical opposition, I am cautiously optimistic, is mostly because of the timeline we are, find ourselves in with 14 days left before signee die, very complex issues, a lengthy bill, and very subtle language, and we're concerned about um, unintended consequences that could be harmful to customers. We are absolutely supportive of transmission, renewable energy, and EV infrastructure investments. Um, Nevada's Resort Association is a world-class leader in sustainability, environmental protection, and clean energy development. We do not oppose the GreenLink transmission projects or the timeline that the Senator is proposing that they be constructed on by 2028, even though the Commission determined that construction of GreenLink North would put too much risk on utility customers at this time. 
We have proposed clarifying changes that would not affect the completion of these projects or their timeline by 2028, but would ensure that the Commission retains authority and regulatory discretion to protect customers from increased rates and making projects more expensive than they need to be. The utility talks about customer refunds. In, 2000, in 2020, the utility overearned during the COVID shutdown approximately $100 million just for Nevada Power Company. We calculate that based on their filings, which provides that 62 million is the customer share of that, 50%. They don't voluntarily give those refunds back. Those refunds were fought for by the Bureau of Consumer Protection and by members of the NRA who are there representing all customers, including their employees. And thanks to the commission's jurisdiction over those issues to ensure that they don't over collect. They are continuing to over earn. And so the commission needs the tools to keep an eye on that. We're not saying that they shouldn't earn their return on investment. They should. But through the IRP process, they do get there to cover our costs. With and that's two minutes. If you could wrap up, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, we're just concerned about EV infrastructure and ensuring that any rate set for the energy that's sent to those units is set in a, not in a 90-day time period, but in a reasonable proceeding where the PUCN has uh, the time to make the right decisions. We appreciate the time. We appreciate the work. And we are hopeful that we can continue to work with the sponsor to resolve the concerns and get out of the opposition lane. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 448 who's here in person? Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and go to the phone lines. Um, and we have 18 minutes left in opposition on the phone, and so we should be able to take about nine callers if we have them. BPS, if you could uh, pull the line, please. Thank you, Chair Harris. Callers, if you'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 448, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Will the first caller with the last three digits of 792 please state and spell your name for the record? You'll have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair Harris. My name is Patrick Donnelly, D-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y. I'm Nevada State Director at the Center for Biological Diversity. We are strong proponents of the renewable energy transition and the complete decarbonization of our economy. And there are many measures in this bill that we do support, but we must oppose SB 448 as written. This bill takes a shoot first, ask questions later approach with regard to the deployment of transmission lines and large scale renewable energy production. SB 448 completely foregoes any level of comprehensive planning or environmental review, instead just throwing the doors open to our public lands with new transmission lines accelerating huge amounts of new industrial energy production in remote parts of our state. Large-scale renewable energy production and high-voltage transmission line deployment can have significant environmental impacts on wildlife, public lands, water resources, and historically marginalized communities. Just since the introduction of GreenLink West at the PUC, a dozen or more solar energy projects have been proposed along its potential alignment. And while that might sound like a good thing to most people, there has been done with no planning at all for where these projects will go. In some cases, they are sited in disastrously bad places for wildlife and the environment or right on the doorstep of national parks. Instead of instructing state agencies to complete a clear-eyed, comprehensive review of where renewable energy might be appropriate in this state, SB 448 would throw open the doors to our most wild and pristine landscapes and rely on the tender mercies of the market and fossil fuel companies like NV Energy to decide the fate of Nevada's wildlands. And that really gets to a fundamental problem here. NV Energy is the fossil fuel industry. Their decades of polluting our climate has put us on the brink of climate disaster, and now we're going to let them be in the driver's seat while we try to clean up their mess and avoid climate catastrophe. Again, we appreciate some of the elements of this bill, but SB 448 will result in significant harm to our public lands and wildlife, and we must oppose. We support renewable energy, but not like this. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 080 please state and spell your name for the record? You'll have two minutes and may begin. My name is Kevin Emmerich. It's spelled E-M-M-E-R-I-C-H. And I'm representing a co-founder of a group called Basin and Range Watch. We're a nonprofit organization that um, looks after the deserts of Nevada and California um, and ranges. 
Um, we are greatly opposed to Senate Bill 448. It was just introduced on Thursday, and we hardly had any time to review this bill. It's designed to create the big transmission center in Nevada, but I don't hear anybody talking about environmental impacts or impacts to communities. Um, I have been told, for example, the Green West Link West project, which will be over 300 miles long and 20% on private land, will actually require eminent domain for a lot of folks in the Mara Loma area. We should be talking about that. Do those people even know about this? Environmentally, Greenlink West will go near Walker Lake. It will be impossible to hide it in the view, and, and that's a bald eagle wintering area. And birds do crash into power lines. It's a known fact. It happens all the time. We know of an area where this Greenlink power line will be built that's in pronghorn breeding habitats near Scotty's Junction, Nevada. Um, um, power lines and design like Greenlink with supporting guy wires have been known to decapitate large game like wild horses and pronghorns. We're going to see applications for solar next to Death Valley National Park in areas where there are the last stronghold of western Joshua trees. I know of solar applications because of the Greenlink lines that are now an important sage grouse habitat, desert tortoise habitat. Um, many um, uh, different types of wildlife habitat will be threatened. Um, we also want to say that um, Transmission causes wildfires um, and uh, droughts and um, the increased heat that we're seeing because of climate change. Putting this Sir, power that's line two minutes if you could please wrap up your comments. I will. I will wrap it up right now saying this will be tacked onto the rate payers, the solar projects, the transmission is not worth it. Please oppose Senate Bill 448. Thanks. For the callers that have just joined us, if you would like to provide testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 448, please press star 9 now to enter the queue. Once again, if you'd like to provide testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 448, please press star 9 now. Chair Harris, at this time, no additional callers have indicated that they would like to provide testimony in opposition to the bill. All right. Thank you so much. Um, just a reminder for folks who are listening, if you did not have a chance to put your position on the record, please remember that you can always submit written comments to the committee. Uh, we will post it on Nellis and the members read it. At least I know some of them do. Okay. Uh, is there anyone in the room who'd like to testify in the neutral position? Senator Harris, members of the committee, uh, Peter Kruger, K-R-U-E-G-E-R. -E -E Given the lateness of the hour and my full comments are on, uh, on Nellis, I, I think it is simply to say that we in the, I'm representing the uh, petroleum marketers convenience store industry here in Nevada, and we think we are considered surrogates for the consumer. If uh, this committee and Senator Brooks and the bill uh, helps ensure th uh, that there is a competitive and market dynamic governing refueling, including alternatives like electricity, uh, you will make the transition more affordable and effective to the public. We are eager to work uh, with the bill's sponsor and help ensuring that uh, EV charging stations uh, are available to all Nevadans. Currently, three of our members have uh, made private investments in EV charging, one rather large one, and uh, we, uh, we want to continue that. Thank you. Okay, anyone else in the room like to testify in the neutral position? Not seeing any. Uh, BPS, can you see if there's anyone on the phone who'd like to testify uh, in the neutral position? Thank you, Chair Harris. Callers, if you'd like to provide neutral testimony for Senate Bill 448, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Will the caller with the last three digits of 393 please state and spell your name for the record? You'll have two minutes and may begin. 
Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Ian Bigley, I-A-N-B-I-G-L-E-Y, and I'm here on behalf of the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. While we appreciate the intent to limit brownouts in urban areas across the West, dedicated funding for historically underserved communities, and living wage jobs, we believe that our transition to a renewable energy economy must be just and put people and planet first. This transition must ensure distributed generation and provide for communities to own their power, not just have access to renewable energy. We have a number of concerns regarding Senate Bill 448, and unfortunately, with the swiftness of this bill hearing, we were unable to connect with the bill sponsors prior to today, but are looking forward to having a discussion. First, the bill is largely focused on single occupancy vehicles, when we should be fundamentally changing the way we move through prioritizing tra mass transit before the luxury of single occupancy vehicles. The representation on the task force is unbalanced, leaning heavily towards corporate interests, while representation for the general public is specifically limited to three. Furthermore, the task force leaves out Nevadan sovereign indigenous nations. This bill would pave the way for Western Shoshone and Paiute lands across Western Nevada to become a massive sacrifice zone through high voltage transmission structure to support large scale centralized energy generation. And so it is essential that we include these communities in the decision making process. Crucial to our transition to renewable energy, we need a distributed energy grid, which facilitates numerous small scale generators sited on rooftops and pre-destroyed -destroyed areas such as abandoned mine lands. And we need to allow communities to own their power. This is essential to limiting sacrifice zones and ensuring Nevadans, not, cor not just corporations, benefit from this transition. While this bill mentions distributed energies, the directive to focus on high voltage transmission and large scale generation limits the feasibility of a truly distributed uh, generation system. A just transition to, renew to a renewable energy economy must shift us from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy and address historic inequities. We urge you to take these concerns into consideration. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 725 please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin now with two minutes. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, this is Andrew McKay, A-N-D-R-E-W. MAC, capital KAY, the Executive Director of the Nevada Franchise Auto Dealers Association. We're the trade association that represents new automobile and heavy truck dealerships across Nevada. Obviously, we are by no means experts in energy policy. That's why I'm providing testimony from the neutral position. But it's important to note that we do support a robust infrastructure plan. To begin, I'd like to thank Senator Birch for bringing this bill forward and recognizing the fact that in order to spur widespread consumer acceptance, and adoption of electric vehicles, strong and reliable energy infrastructure is a key aspect of this overall strategy. While our automobile manufacturer, manufacturer partners have committed to spending nearly a quarter trillion dollars to develop and bring to market new electric vehicle models, including 18 this year and 34 next year, and over 100 different models by 2025, a robust charging infrastructure will have a positive impact on consumers' consideration of purchasing a new, new and or used uh, electric vehicle. And SB 448 will be essential in making this happen. We are, our, our dealer members have invested millions of dollars and will invest millions more in tooling and employee training rele related to electric vehicles. We're extremely excited to help bring more EVs, both new and used, to our customers and to the market as a whole. And again, We'd like to thank Senator Brooks for bringing this bill forward, and we look forward to working with him and other interested parties in advancing the electrification of our transportation sector. You guys have a nice evening. You've worked a long night. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 031 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin now with two minutes. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is uh, Cesar Diaz. Good evening, uh, Chair Harris, members of the committee. My name is Cesar Diaz, and I'm with ChargePoint uh, and a resident of Las Vegas. I'm testifying before you in a neutral position of SB 448. ChargePoint is a leading provider of EV charging stations and network services in North America and the globe. ChargePoint's network includes more than 650 charging spots in Nevada. In addition, ChargePoint's drivers have access to hundreds of additional charging ports in Nevada through roaming agreements. 
Charge Point thanks Senator Brooks and the bill's co-authors and sponsors for considering transportation electrification in this bill. We are currently neutral on this bill seeking modifications uh, at the moment. From Charge Point's perspective, we support the efforts to accelerate transportation electrification. While this bill recognizes the importance of a diversity and ownership of charging stations, we feel that the bill could benefit by clarifying the mechanisms to achieve this diversity and ownership. Section 49 pertains to EV charging infrastructure to be developed between 2022 and 2024. We request that provisions be added to support increased consumer choice, competition, and innovation in electric vehicle charging and private capital investment. This language is already contained in Section 14. It should also be in Section 49 to ensure a competitive market for EV charging services is present. With these minor changes, we believe this will allow electric vehicle charging markets to develop in a competitive manner, attracting private capital, which will lower the cost and the risk of the rate payer. I thank you for the opportunity to testify this evening. I look forward to continuing to work with members of this committee to ensure the development of EV charging infrastructure is in the best interest of Nevada. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 377 please state and spell your name for the record? You may begin now with two minutes. Chair Harris and members of the Senate Growth and Infrastructure Committee, my name is Jaina Moan, J-A-I-N-A-M-O-A-N, and I'm the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. Thank you for this opportunity to provide neutral testimony for Senate Bill 448. The Nature Conservancy supports the new energy economy and, events, and investments in clean energy, which are necessary for addressing the urgent threat of climate change. We believe that any scenario for energy build-out in Nevada should include strategic implementation that allows for our economy to thrive while balancing impacts on our ecosystems. This can be done with smart from the start planning. The Nevada Climate Strategy, published in December 2020, highlighted the need for smart from the start renewable energy planning in the complex challenges for Nevada section. A smart from the start energy plan identifies and prioritizes lower impact areas where renewable energy generation, storage, and transmission can be deployed while minimizing impacts to natural lands, cultural resources, recreation, and other conservation values. By applying such an approach to future transmission plans under consideration in the state, we believe will allow us to achieve our climate goals while creating a more efficient, equitable, and comprehensive process. Such a process generates value for all parties by harnessing knowledge from diverse stakeholders. Synthesizing this knowledge improves planning, permitting, coordination, and implementation decisions, and increases the odds that renewable projects will minimize costs, maximize maximize economic benefits and prevent avoidable mistakes. We want to alert the committee to our written testimony. It describes the benefits of a smart from the start approach to energy planning and offers recommendations for next steps we can take to ensure that we deploy energy resources in a way that minimizes adverse impacts for both people and nature. Thank you for consideration of our comments. And BPS, before we take the next caller, I'm going to have to uh, put a pause on this hearing and invite uh, Vice Chair Brooks back up to do the work session very quickly uh, so that members uh, who have pressing issues can depart if they absolutely need to. All right, so I'm going to uh, recess the hearing on Senate Bill 448 and open up. Sorry, Ms. Scully, I didn't give you much of a warning. Uh, <laughs> and open up uh, the work session on Senate Bill 424? 442. 442. Oh, so close. Uh, Ms. Scully, if you could just run us through that very quickly, please. Thank you, Chair Harris. For the record, Susan Scully with the Research Division of the Legislative Council Bureau. Senate Bill 442 was sponsored by the Office of Finance, heard in this committee on May 12th. This bill prohibits the Office of Energy from changing the green building rating system or accepting applications on or after the effective date of the bill. The measure eliminates the program to grant partial ab abatements on July 1, 2035. At the hearing, the issue of changing the effective date was raised, and there is a proposed amendment to change the effective date of the bill to July 1, 2021. This bill is part of the executive budget. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scully. Do members have any questions? Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not so much a question as a, uh, just a comment. Um, 
while I'm certainly in agreement that we don't want to make it so that every uh, building we build now, now that we're adopting the new uh, IECC, um, uh, it sounds like statewide, although that's a local uh, designation or a local decision. Um, what, I, what I just can't get comfortable with is we're eliminating what has been a very successful program to develop uh, uh, energy efficient buildings. Um, we're eliminating the uh, incentive without uh, putting a new one in its place. Um, I'm really concerned that this is going to stall it. Um, so I'm going to vote no because I'm not comfortable with it, although I support the, the, the idea. I may change on the floor, but uh, I'll be a no tonight. Senator Hammond. I'm going to be, be a yes with reservation, just so you know. Any uh, further discussion or questions on the bill? Senator Brooks. Is this the amendment where the Nevada Resorts Association wanted to continue to get tax credits a little bit longer? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Brooks. It is my understanding that this is a, an amendment submitted in conjunction uh, with uh, those stakeholders. Okay. Uh, at this time, I will uh, accept a motion to amend and do pass. Uh, I move amend do pass. Do we have a second? Second from Senator Spearman. Any discussion on the motion? All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Anyone else a nay? Were you a yes with reservations? I thought you were a no with reservations. Uh, Madam Chair, that's just my mask, I guess. I was a yes with reservations. Okay, I apologize then. Great, we've got our vote. Uh, and it passes uh, 4 to one I will go ahead and take the floor statement on that. We'll close the work session on Senate Bill 442 and reopen the hearing on Senate Bill 448. I will kick it back to BPS to continue a neutral testimony and we will take about 10 more minutes of testimony on the phone. Will the caller with the last three digits of 545 please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good evening, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Scott Leadham, representing Southwest Gas. That's S-C-O-T-T-L-E-E-D-O-M. Southwest Gas supports many of the provisions of Senate Bill 448. We do, however, have a concern with one section of the bill that we wanted to bring to the committee's attention. Section 35 of the bill states that there is no presumption of prudence in the public utilities rate case filings. This issue of rebuttable presumption in a public utilities burden of proving reasonableness in a rate case filing is the subject of an active appeal to the Nevada Supreme Court. With the case ongoing and yet to be heard by the court, we feel it is uh, premature for the legislature to weigh in on the policy prior to the justices ruling on the issue. We're also concerned with the precedent it sets for the legislature to adopt policies that are subject of active appeals being considered by the Nevada Supreme Court. It's our hope that the legislature, legislature will wait and determine what the uh, Supreme Court concludes prior to taking action on this particular issue. We thank you very much for your consideration. That concludes my comments. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 986 please state and spell your name for the record? You'll have two minutes and maybe begin. Uh, hello, I'm not the committee. Uh, this is John Hatter, H A D D E R. I am the director of Great Basin Resource Watch. We are testifying as neutral. The general public has had very little time to consider the contents of this bill before this hearing. So SB 448 needed more encompassing, inclusive process, especially when the contents of the bill will affect frontline extraction communities. <laughs> we are in a precarious position. Uh, of needing to take prompt and swift action to try to restore the climate balance. <laughs> Largely, these actions focus on reducing the fusion of greenhouse gases, mostly from the burning of fossil fuels. Electrical generation and transportation represent roughly 25 and 27 percent, respectively, of greenhouse gas contributions in the United States. Therefore, shifting these sectors aggressively away from fossil fuels, which is inherent in SB 448, <laughs> and a move to renewable energy and electrification of transportation, a transition using new technology and materials is at hand. 
what is being envisioned is a massive increase in mining for these new materials. So the expansion of existing mines and development of many new mines goes hand in hand with aggressive renewable energy goals and electrical vehicle deployment in the absence of other policies to reduce demand and reuse materials. Large scale mining is very destructive to natural ecosystems and often disruptive to hosting communities. Metals mining is one of the world's dirtiest industries, responsible for 10% of global change impacts, according to the United Nations Environmental Program. Great Basin Resource Watch does support transitioning from fossil fuel vehicles. However, the deployment needs to be done judiciously. Electric vehicles, like other technologies, are going to require increased demand for many materials like lithium, cobalt, nickel, rare earths, and so on. Currently, there is no plan to address the inequity of frontline communities that will shoulder the effects of mining for these materials. Backer Pass is a good example of pressure on frontline communities. Those communities are asking, what is the sacrifice that the quote unquote. And sir, you're, are you're rapidly in this approaching that two minutes. If you could wrap up, Great. please. Great Basin Resource, yes, thank you. Great Basin Resource Watch is calling for a just transition. From both environmental justice and climate justice perspectives, it would seem better to aggressively develop our public transit and otherwise minimize vehicle miles traveled, particularly passenger vehicles in decreased demand for materials and extraction. This way, we will decrease greenhouse gases. And so we're going to have to move on to the next caller. Please, please feel free to submit the, the remainder of your comments in writing. BPS, if we could move on. Thank you. Will the next caller with the last three digits of 564 please slowly state and spell your name for the record? You may begin now with two minutes. Good evening, members of the committee. My name is Chelsea Hand, C-H-E-L-S-E-Y-H-A-N-D. I'm the Outreach and Program Coordinator for Great Basin Resource Watch. And while our position is neutral, we see a lot of shortcomings of SB 448. First of all, the lack of emphasis on public transit and other low impact modes of transit. There is no mention of investment to decrease vehicle miles traveled. There should be an emphasis on how to get people away from single car occupancy. We need to reduce emissions and demand for materials, aka reducing the need to mine more materials. Failing to address the fundamental problem of consumption and transportation inefficiency in the U.S. will further exacerbate environmental injustice and likely not solve the underlying problem. Secondly, the no directives on recycling. The first section should acknowledge the importance of fostering recycling, particularly in product design. Recycling comes in over and over again as less resource intensive than raw extraction and potentially could reduce raw extraction by 25% to 55%, according to a recent report sponsored by Earthworks. Third, the lack of emphasis on distributed generation. Distributed generation is more in the public interest, interest by using already disturbed lands. It's more energy efficient since electricity is used close to the demand, minimizing transmission losses. It also creates more employment in general and over the long term. Import importantly, will tend to provide employment to local and smaller electrical technicians and companies. So it's an economic justice concern as well. Next, long-range transmission development is too aggressive in the bill. This appears to benefit the utility most. Some transmission development... And ma'am, you're at your two minutes. If you could wrap up, please. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, BPS, we will take two more callers, please. Thank you, Chair. For any additional callers who would like to provide testimony in the neutral position for Senate Bill 448, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Chair Harris, at this time, there are no additional callers who would like to provide neutral testimony. All right, thank you. Um, I'll bring it back here into the room, uh, Senator Brooks, if you'd like to make any closing comments before we close out this hearing. I just want to thank you and the committee members for giving this such a thorough and comprehensive hearing, and, uh, and, um, and I urge your support. All right, thank you. With that, we will go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 448, and I'll kick it back over to you, uh, broadcast, to see if there's anyone who'd like to submit any public comment. 
Thank you, Chair Harris. Callers, if you'd like to provide public comment on today's meeting, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Once again, if you'd like to provide public comment, please press star nine now. Chair Harris, at this time, no callers have indicated that they would like to provide public comment. All right. Um, we will uh, most likely have a committee meeting on uh, May 19th at 3.30 p.m. Let's all plan to be here. Uh, if for some reason floor has to run long, uh, we may cancel or have to adjust our time. So please be patient with us as we attempt to process bills uh, for the rest of the session. And with that, we are adjourned.